This is a simple bracket. 68 teams, 7 rounds, 1 champion. For the next 552 hours, this gauntlet of insanity will test every fiber of your basketball knowledge. And even when you're right, chaos will prove you wrong. Bennett out to Blackman quickly with one second to go. Blackman shot off the rim, and LSU has won it. Some say this tournament is all about matchups. The luck of the draw is the only law here. But if that's true, why do the best rise to the top time after time? And Kansas completes the biggest championship comeback. This simple bracket is a place where unknown names become legends. Michael Jordan. Where Goliath meets UFC David. UFC makes history. Titans battle Titans. And where chaos waits in the shadows. They have no timeouts for Oh, he causes too many timeouts. That's a technical foul. He called a timeout. Michigan doesn't yes. have any. There is nothing simple about this bracket. This is madness. This year, we ask, can a champion repeat for the first time in nearly two decades? Can Purdue rise like a phoenix in Phoenix? And does the SEC have a contender of their own? Welcome to the madness. We are on the road to Arizona. Welcome to the Hoop Southbound Show and welcome to the madness. By the way, what a great intro by Zeke. That was a lot better, I felt, than our normal YouTube countdown for a premiere. This is what the season is all about. A few hours ago, the selection committee revealed an absolutely insane 68 teams who are in the field of this year's tournament. And we are here to break down the whole thing. I mean, my goodness, we got a field. <laughs> For you guys who are new to the Hoop Southbound show, my name is Maddie. And I am joined today by my co-host David and our special guest Caleb Shepard from Whoopig Weekly. But that's not the full roster because we also have Isaac Bourne from Mid-Major Madness, Christian Sykes from Crimson Crossover, Bracket Dom from Bracketometry, and Nathan Neese from Section YY8 Podcast. Yeah, full full show today. This is a huge show with an all-star cast. We are breaking down the entire bracket. And I promise today you will pick up at least one piece of basketball knowledge that you didn't have before you sat down to watch this show. I have worked for about two months on this show to bring you the best March Madness coverage that we possibly can get out there to you with a little bit of an SEC slant. After all, this is an SEC basketball podcast. <laughs> We have a lot to talk about, so let's get into it with some bracketology. Here's a look at the top 16 seeds in the field. Guys, taking a look at this, what stands out to you? Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I think it's interesting also to go back in time just here a little bit and just kind of see the changes that occurred. You know, the one seeds, and they pretty much stayed the same, except for Arizona from back when the committee revealed its uh it's top 16 a few about a month ago at this point, um, you know, and then you're also looking at Iowa State jumping up to a two seed, which was well deserved. San Diego State's no longer in this group. Wisconsin's no longer in this group, um, you know, and then pretty much everything else stayed somewhat stable. There were a couple of changes, but for the most part, what the committee put out there stayed consistent. Um, Tennessee still ended up in the Midwest as a two, which is extremely notable. Um, but yeah, it's it, to me, what happened in the top 16 makes a lot of sense for what we've seen throughout the course of the season. Um, Maddie, what are you, what are you kind of thinking here? Yeah, you know, just taking a look at it, um, kind of comparing it to like we talked about the, um, top, top 12, that kind of weird statistic that, that there hasn't been a national championship outside of, um, that section, and I think it's pretty consistent, you know, with what we're seeing. We we got North Carolina in there. We've seen um, Tennessee, like you said, Arizona's in that slot. So a lot of teams to look forward to and a lot of teams that I think we're going to be seeing late in the tournament. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, and then we'll take a quick look at your ear and put it on the screen for our viewers at YouTube. These were all the automatic bids that were given out. And this was really where a lot of the chaos came from in the bracket this year. Let's talk to Bracket Dom about this bracketology and how this whole thing shaked out because there was such a chaotic Champions Week that the bubble, this is probably the best bubble we've seen in years in this tournament. And we are welcome. We welcome to the show the once champion. Uh, as <laughs> was, we were just joking before he came on here. The once champion of the bracket, back, bracket matrix, bracket dom. Welcome back again, man. What a nutty bracket, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I not what I expected in several areas, but I think it's what a lot of people didn't expect. So, I, it's, so be it. <laughs> I, I mean, I remember texting or not texting, but tweeting at you last night. It's like I apologize for the questions I'm about to ask on this bracket <laughs> because, like, it's going to be in pure insanity. So, I have <laughs> questions too. So, <laughs> <laughs> let's try to figure this thing out the best we can. So, first off. For those who may not be in the know on college basketball, what the heck happened last night? Because, I mean, certainly oh, yeah. that's what caused all the chaos. Absolutely. No, last night we just, because uh, there's always the potential of bid thieves. Because if you win your conference tournament, you're in. Um, in a bid thieves where if you win your conference tournament and you weren't going to be in regardless. And that happened three times yesterday after already happening the day before. So... Yeah, if you look at if you're watching the selection show and you saw that first four out, those probably should have been the last four teams in in a normal year. So a bit crazy for sure. Yeah, certainly. So okay, so let's start out with some of the things that I just found odd. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. So no offense, I know we're an SEC, you know, SEC show here, but how the heck did Texas A and M end up with a nine seed? Any clue there? I, see, I mean, are you saying in a good way or a bad way? Well, it felt like it ended up in a good way there for Texas A&M because I saw people with them Absolutely. like as a last four in and should have been an 11 or 10 is what people were kind of saying about Texas A&M. They end up two spots better at a nine. So what kind of happened there? Yeah, I had them as a 10 in my last one, but I, I thought they were going to be playing in a play in game in Dayton. Uh, the big knock on their resume was just that they had a bunch of those Q3 bad losses but the rest of the resume was fantastic so clearly the committee was just not faulting you for those q3 losses that much on the flip side i, I still think they don't like q4 losses and, and there was a few places where that was shown but clearly to the difference between how they poorly view a q3 versus a q4 loss uh, it was pretty big and heck maybe they don't even care that much about q4 losses with fau so and they just really this year emphasized having the good wins over uh, punishing you for having the bad losses. A team with just like a clean resume that yeah, they, they didn't win any big games, but they didn't lose any bad games either. Like Oklahoma got left out. So this committee, uh, yeah, as I'm talking out loud, clearly values the high level wins more than they punish you for the bad losses. So you immediately jumped into what I was going to ask it a little bit. Let's talk about those last four in, first four out, you know, everything like that. All right. So the last four in were Boise State, Colorado, Virginia, and Colorado State. I, I know that this was just chaotic about like these teams in this group, but, you know, the Mountain West is able to get all six teams in like people were talking about all season, but two of them end up in the last four in. Was that, you know, what the general thinking was going to be? Or did people have these teams seated much higher? Yeah, people had these teams seated much higher. The Mountain West in general is where I think most bracketologists miss the most in the bracket with several of those teams seated multiple seed lines lower than expected. I mean, excuse me, Nevada I had up as a seven. They were a 10, almost in a play in themselves. And Colorado State and Boise, I had them in eight, nine games, not in play in games. So yeah, that was absolutely stunning. At least they still all got in, but I would have said going into conference tournament week, the Mountain West was getting six regardless. Clearly had New Mexico not won the conference tournament and had Colorado State not beat Nevada in the first round. I don't think either of them were getting in. So they just did not respect the Mountain West and the strength of uh, strength of record to extent and also... The uh, why am I drawing a blank here? It's been a long day. The, the the BPI that's the what I was searching for. Those really didn't like the Mountain West, and I think everyone saw San Diego State up as a four seed in the reveal, and was like, ah, they, that they agree that it's an outlier that uh, that BPI doesn't like the Mountain West. 
So they're not going to, they're going to kind of treat it as an outlier. Clearly they didn't treat that as an outlier. The BPI hates the Mountain West. So the committee hated them too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, guys, do you have any questions real fast uh, before I go through some of the SEC teams that I found kind of interesting on their seed lines? Yeah, I think my biggest one, um, Dom, so what were some of the teams that shocked you that ended up not being in? You know, I think we were all kind of excited to see Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Indiana State um, get that bid in there. Um, one that was left out and uh, St. John's as well. So were there any that you were kind of surprised didn't get get in? I, honestly, I mean, that's the one place where I, I did feel good about my bracket. Um, at Oklahoma was the only team I had in that didn't get in. They were the first team out, and I had them in a play-in game. So, And really, that's just some of those other teams, like you said, Indiana State and whatnot, I didn't have them in, and that was really just because of the bid thieves from yesterday, and they would have been in if it weren't for the three bid thieves yesterday. So as much as I don't like the seeding of this bracket, I think they did a pretty good job selecting the teams. I mean, Virginia over Oklahoma was my only miss in that front. And personally, if I'm on the committee, I would have had Virginia and Oak over Oklahoma. I, I think they deserved it more, um, and, and they got it. I just didn't think the committee would view it that way. So good job on them selecting the teams, just some questionable seating. <laughs> okay, well, Caleb, do you have anything? Um, Look into this bracket. You know, we, we talked about it before, jumping on everything. What is with the, you know, it seems like the seating for Michigan State, like their team that very surprised in that 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 matchup that they got in at that high of a level. Yeah, it's just really because the predictive metrics love them and say that even though they didn't have the great wins and losses, they, they're still a really good team. So as long as the committee thought they were good enough to be in the field, they were going to naturally get a bump uh, because of that. Uh, I had them out of the play-ins. Uh, personally, I, I think they probably should have been in them, but I bumped them out of the play-ins up to a 10, not in the play-ins because of that. And the committee just did it one further and actually bumped them all the way up to a nine. Do you think, uh, do you think Michigan state was one of those teams that were in before, um, you know, before they started doing the seating on like on Friday when they started voting everybody in, do you think Michigan state was already good? I, I'm pretty sure they were already good. Yeah, I, I really did not expect them to sweat at all. I and mean, when there were four bid thieves yesterday, I thought that might push them into a plan, even though I didn't have them there. But I never saw Michigan State completely missing the dance. <laughs> Fair enough. Maddie, anything else? I think that's all I got. Um, okay, I'll, I'll ask about the SEC teams real fast. Okay. Well, then one thing, sorry, just on that last question, I'm going to jump in on real quick before we go to those. One thing that did surprise me is that if there weren't so many bid stealers, St. John's still wouldn't have been in. I, that was what that was I, had them, I had them as my first team out, and they weren't even in the first four out. So and that's one I would have missed if there weren't the bid thieves yesterday. If there weren't so many bid thieves yesterday, I would have had St. John's in my bracket and would have got that one wrong. So I, I think what hurt them is that last win over Seton Hall was considered a home win because the Big East tournament was uh, <laughs> in Madison Square Garden. We can talk about Even that. Even though the yeah. fans were not, it wasn't all of their fans. I think that should have counted as a neutral game. I thought maybe the committee would think that too and factor it in. But yeah, clearly they looked at those as a home win and a home loss in the tournament, which I think bumped them down. Yeah, it's certainly so. That's that's one of the stranger things that exists is that a conference tournament is a home game for St. John's. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's truly bizarre. You sell equal amount of tickets, but it's a home game for the uh for the Red Storm. But yeah, I'm with you. I I saw that also a lot of people had had St. John's in. And so you definitely weren't alone in that thinking. And I, I know a lot of people who were surprised by that. Um, but of course, committee wants what the committee wants. So Yeah, um, no. <laughs> I mean, I think they can, I think St. John's would have had a serious gripe if there weren't four bid thieves about not being in. I, so now I, I think they were going to be out regardless with all those bid thieves. But yeah, that would have been a very interesting uh, debate on them if there were one or two less bid thieves and they still did get left out. Yeah, certainly. So, all right. So let's hit a couple of these SEC teams. I already asked yeah. you about AM and the kind of the surprise nine in there. Um, did Florida have a shot to you at ever getting that six or were they pretty much uh, done um, prior to this, um, you know, getting that seven? And I, I don't suspect the loss to Auburn had anything to do with them getting that seven today. No, I, I thought they were going to get a six because last year the committee actually cared about conference tournament results except the, the Sunday ones. I mean, we saw Marquette get a two seed last year after winning the Big East championship. So I thought with that run they made, they were going to get a six. 
So I, I think I mean it's a different committee every year, and this one I think put a little less emphasis on the conference tournaments than ones have passed. So uh, two years ago, if I was just on my old train of thinking as conference tournaments don't matter, I probably would have had Florida as a seven and got it. Last year kind of tricked me, and now they reverted back to their old ways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So for Auburn hitting that four seed, I know that a lot of people were starting to push them up to a three, um, but Kentucky got a three over over Auburn, who was at a four. Um, really, what do you think was the difference there between those two um, getting the three and the four, and what you know how that played out? I, I'd say again, just the conference tournament not mattering as much as it should have. Same story there. I mean. Maybe even had the SEC championship been on Saturday, um, Auburn might have ended up a three seed ahead of Kentucky. Maybe that's how close it was, but the Sunday results never matter. So I, I think they just didn't get any bump from actually being the SEC champions. I had them as a four seed going into the tournament, and, and that's what they ended up getting. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, I haven't looked at the seed list yet, but you know Iowa State we know they're not the number one, number two. So they were nowhere close to really getting that number one seed. Like a lot of people were trying to push that narrative last night. Um, with that, do you think that's because Tennessee was closer to a one than Iowa State? Or who ended up being the number one, number two seed? I, I believe that was Tennessee that ended up being the number one, number two seed, which I, d I did put Iowa State over them. Uh, it, not that that mattered. They were both twos. But I mean, it, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but... They didn't care about the conference tournaments. Eh? <laughs> I, Let's just I mean, hit this point on the head because like we did an entire episode last week about me talking about conference tournaments not yeah. mattering. And here's the committee once again saying they don't matter. So. <laughs> I just last year was such a red herring. They, they, they fooled me. They cared about them last year randomly. Made me think, oh, now they care about them a little bit more and they're right back to not caring about them again. So yeah, that's because I think had Iowa, those games all mattered for Iowa State. I still don't think they would have been a one over North Carolina, but I think they would have been at least number six overall on the seed list. I think they were still eight on the seed list, if I saw correctly. So bit of a surprise there. But yeah, they just didn't factor that in. <laughs> All right. Um, Dom, anything else that stood out to you about this bracket that you just really want to hammer home in people's mind when it comes to bracketology here? Yeah. I mean, again, I'll just say if you're not happy about where your team's seeded you're in the tournament. I, I'm not happy about the seedings either, but I think they did a good job of getting the right teams in and the right teams out. Like I said, the only one I missed was Oklahoma uh, and Virginia. And personally, in my opinion, Virginia deserved that over Oklahoma. So if I was on the committee, this is probably the exact 68 I would have had. So good job on them there. Seeding, yeah. But again, <laughs> everyone outside of the play-in team games you're playing the same amount of games. It doesn't matter where you're seated. And if you're the better team, you'll go out there and win them. So, and maybe Boise, Colorado State, you can have a little bit of a gripe that you have to play an extra game. But yeah, now you get to come out first game of the whole thing and send a message that you shouldn't have been there. So that's even an exciting opportunity for them. <laughs> Guys, anything else for Dom before he takes off here? How's it, Dom? Um, so... Out, out of this, what do you think is the most likely upset? That's the question I'm going to ask everybody today. Ooh, okay. Let's look here. So upset. What's the what's the lowest seed? What are we talking like twelve or lower? Is what we're yeah. Talking yeah. Let's go something on? like that. Okay. Uh, looking at the bracket now, let's see. I, I think one that is catching my eyes. I think Grand Canyon can beat St. Mary's in that twelve five. All right, Grant. I mean St. Mary's had a terrible out of conference. They didn't even look like they were a tournament team. And then they ran through the WCC, which I, I don't think was very good this year. And, and it beat Gonzaga, who I also kind of had a down year, but they just rolled the rest of the WCC to kind of get those metrics back up. But I don't know, Grand Canyon's a really good team. They beat San Diego State earlier this year, only four losses on the season. And St. Mary's, everyone said, oh, they turned it around from that horrible start of the year. I, I just think maybe given who they were playing, it looked like they turned it around. So I, I'm kind of liking Grand Canyon to pull that one there. I guess in that same vein, you could say McNeese over Gonzaga too, if I'm being a WCC hater right now. But uh, even though I usually am, am one ringing the bell for those teams, but I'm not sure if I quite see it in that one. I don't think McNeese really matches up well with Gonzaga, but that could be closer than expected. All right. Well, good deal, Dom. Uh why don't you tell everybody where they can find you out for next season when the brackets go crazy again? And, yeah. Uh, want to know who's yeah. going to be 
in this thing. <laughs> Hopefully you still want to trust me after this year. But yeah, follow <laughs> along next year uh, at Bracket Dom on Twitter um, and check out my projections. Don't look at this year's projection, but on Bracketometry.com. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We'll, we'll just call Dom the Arkansas Razorbacks. We had high expectations, yeah. but the last couple of years have been excellent, but this year was just a fluke. So we'll- Exactly. Everyone gets one <laughs> off here. <laughs> yeah, we'll roll with that. Dom, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right, everybody, before you fill out your bracket, there's a lot of information and trends for March that people may not be aware of. David, you look at this stuff all the time. You're a little bit insane. Definitely probably the most knowledgeable person I know about these weird statistics as we go into March. So what do you got for us? Yeah. Hey, Caleb, um, you know, feel free to be my guinea pig here uh, with me here. And this is going to be a crazy little breakdown. But yeah, everybody kind of grabs their bracket right after it comes out and just starts feeling it out off a gut feeling or whatever. I used to have a buddy who basically picked no upsets. This is the truth. He picked no upsets for the entire uh, first uh, first round of the tournament. Uh, needless to say, he did that did not go to plan. But uh, Caleb, what's your method kind of for filling out the bracket? Yeah, so I look at it when it comes out. You know, I always like to consider the matchups, especially in those those seedings that are traditionally have more upsets, and then look at the teams and you know some of their key players, things like that. And go from there. But in the past, you know, two years ago, I got my wife into it and she just went through and I told her the names and she picked them and she got like 98% of the brackets. So I don't know if my method is the best in the world either. So, and you know what? That's what part of the madness is, is that like, you do you really need logic in March? Because this is madness. It's it's in the name. Um, But yeah, I, I totally agree with you. There's a lot of things out there that, you know, would make more sense if, uh, you know, normally, but I've seen people pick based off of mascot names they like better and things like that, but it tends to work. But for me, once I get done filling out my bracket on gut, I, I throw it away um, and I, I do it right uh, the next time around. Now, this is how I do it. And in no way do I promise a perfect bracket for anyone out there. Um, but I, I've taken a lot of advice from Vegas gamblers uh, and trying to figure out how to do this and studying their methods for doing picks. And I do decent in my bracket. So the first thing I do is I look at the trends of the tournament. There are nine trends that have a long history in this tournament. And the first one is probably the one everyone is the most familiar with. Caleb, you were just talking about it, the traditional upsets. In the history of this tournament, we've only had two number one seeds that have been upset in the first round. Uh, the number one seeds are 150 to two all time against the 16 seeds. Uh, most notably, the first time it happened was when Virginia was upset by UMBC. Uh, the second time it happened was last year when uh, FDU beat Purdue. Uh, but Caleb, do you know what the most interesting uh, thing about that first time upset when it happened? I don't. Can you tell me, David? Yeah, Virginia came back the next season and won the national championship. Uh, Purdue is looking to do the same thing uh, this year. So after they were upset by a 16 seed the next following year, Virginia became national champions. Let's see what Purdue can do here. Um, second, a 15 seed has beaten a two seed the last three years in a row since 2021. Oral Roberts beat Ohio State. 2022, St. Peter's beats Kentucky. I'm sorry about the trauma, uh, Kentucky fans who are watching. And in 2023, Princeton did, in fact, beat Arizona. So far, none of the so far, none of those teams who were upset have made it back to the Sweet 16. That's what's even more interesting. And five of the last seven two seeds who were upset in the first round have yet to return to the Sweet 16. Duke and Michigan State State are the only only schools who have made it back in the last 12 years. So we'll see which way Arizona goes this season. Uh, the third trend I look at is that this one's actually kind of weird for people. Um, the seven seed traditionally beats the 10 seed a little bit more often than you think. It's actually a lopsided series. The number seven seed beats the 10 seed at 60.8%, whereas the nine seeds are the one who normally beats the eights, um, which is also just a strange one to think about when you're seeding this bracket out. And this one, of course, is pretty famous at this point. The 12 seed has a habit of upsetting a five. That's the most popular one. Um, Caleb, last year we had no fives get upset by a 12, but what are you thinking about this year? More or less likely to pick a 12 this season. I'm going to go with more likely. I, I feel more likely as well. And there's a lot of good 12 seats this year. All right. So let's get into the stuff that helps us kind of pick a champion. Defense matters in March. Since 2012, only three final four teams have ranked outside the top 40 and defensive efficiency on Kempom. The last team to do that was Miami last season. They ranked at 99th. 
Uh, Duke this year, or Duke the year before that in 2022, was also one of those teams who were outside the top 40, and then UCLA the year before in 2021. So it seems to be a trend that's happening more often, but out of all those three teams, they lost their first game in the Final Four. Now, this one, I don't know how many people are familiar with. I, I know I've talked about it on the show, but the AP poll is useless. But there is one thing about the AP poll. A top 12 team in the week six AP poll has won the tournament since 2004. Last team who fell outside of that trend was 2003 Syracuse Orange, who ranked completely outside of the top 25 coming into that point. And that was, of course, Carmelo Anthony's team. Uh, and that team was very, very good. And Carmelo Anthony, of course, having one of the best all-time college seasons. But the reason I feel like this trend works out so much, it's right after the MTEs, and we're starting to see the teams that gelled the fastest in the earliest portion of the season and then took on great competition and showed some promise at that point. It kind of goes hand in hands with the one that Jimmy Dykes likes to talk about, the MTE champions. Often or not, the national champion won an MTE. So also another trend I've been talking about a lot this season, the number of McDonald's All-Americans in the Final Four has been dropping since 2015. I believe we have hit an all-time low uh, last season. Then again, also... Don't normally pick five seeds for your national champion. Five seeds is the only seed to never win the NCAA tournament. I believe that's because they sit in a terrible spot in the bracket. Uh, they normally get a tough mid-major in the first round. Then they face a top 16 seed in the second round. And it's just tough to make it to the Sweet 16 from that spot. Uh, and then you're facing a number one seed pretty much immediately after that. It's a horrible, horrible spot um, to get through. And it, it, it's it's rough. Um, so 10 of the last 13 national champions were in ESPN's BPI top four. Those include 2000. Uh, the teams that were outside of that were 2022 Kansas, uh, 2014 UConn, and 2011 UConn. So, out of all those trends, what does Vegas tell us to pick? They're looking for two of the top three scorers to be seniors or juniors. That goes in line with the McDonald's All Americans trend. Rank the top five. They want a team that's ranked top five in ESPN's BPI. They want a team that hits 36% of their threes or at least ranked top 15 from three-point percentage. This one is big because the number is random, um, but most of our national championships have shot an above-average three-point shooting. Um, and then those teams that rank in the top 25 in Kim Palm adjust deficient, our defensive efficiency. And then also proven coaching seems to be a trend that seems to be more consistent. That matches a lot of the trends we that that's a lot that matches a lot of the trends we've covered. Let's take the week six eighteen poll and break it down. So, Caleb, out of those teams, we've got a pretty decent field. Um, I'm gonna look at this again because it's changed since the bracket changed up and everything. But out of all those teams who were in that field, just Oklahoma was the only team not to make the tournament. So immediately eliminate Oklahoma from this mess. Uh, I don't think that's a surprise to you that I'm not choosing Oklahoma as a national champion because of that. Um, but let's go ahead and just eliminate all the defenses that are not in the top 40 in Kempom. So that eliminates Gonzaga and that eliminates Baylor. So let's eliminate all the teams that aren't either in the top 75 in three-point shooting or they don't shoot 36% or better behind the arc. So that's no Kansas. No Houston, no Marquette, no North Carolina, and no Tennessee. So let's take a look at the BPI, and that would eliminate Creighton at this point. Uh, I'm going to double check that because they just updated the BPI, and I'm going to make sure that that's consistent right now with what the top five looks like. And yeah, out of the top five, we are left with a handful of teams. We are left with UConn, who's sitting at number two in the BPI, Purdue, who's sitting at number three, and Arizona, who's sitting at number five. That fits the Vegas trend um, or the Vegas pick out of this scenario. So out of all that, how do we pick one? And yeah, I, I think these are all good teams. I think you could pick any of them. I think they're solid. But let's see if we can't take it a step further and look at two of the three top scorers being seniors or juniors. That's a Vegas suggestion. Um, for Arizona, you got two seniors leading the way in Love and Ballo. Uh, for Purdue, you got two seniors leading the way in Zach Eady and Lance Jones. For UConn, you got Newton and Caravan, um, both grad students, uh, upperclassmen, no break there. Uh, and then all three of these teams were in the top 25 adjusted defenses. And let's go to coaching. I think this is where we get to eliminate somebody. Uh, I think Tommy Lloyd is your weakest coaches candidate out of those 
out of those three, two and two all time in the tournament, uh, a little bit unproven in March. Dan Hurley just won a national championship, um, but he has had less uh, less games in the NCAA tournament than Matt Painter or than Painter. Uh, it's tough between these two. Earlier this year, candid coaches uh, voted Painter as the best coach not to make a Final Four yet. So I'm going to try to find one more trend here to pick a champion. Um, now, this is tough because there hasn't been a team to repeat as national champions since 2007. So if you like that streak to continue, then you like Purdue. If you don't, you go UConn. And UConn is a team that traditionally likes to break these trends. They're fitting in a lot of those gaps there. Caleb, what do you think, Purdue or UConn? I think when you look at it and break it down, to me, it's really hard to not pick UConn with how complete of a team they are and how well they've been playing all season. And, and I, like you said, it, it kind of goes, it goes against that mold since 2007. No other team since Florida has done that. But I think we might see that trend break this year with UConn going back to back champs. I do like Dan Hurley. I do like the coaching. It is a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting pick here uh, to go for a repeat champion um, for the first time. But like, We'll see. UConn looks promising, but I, I think any of those three teams that I mentioned, Arizona, Purdue, or UConn are a solid pick, really. And I, I have a list of teams here that I like based on different reasons. All three of those teams are in my platinum picks. Um, they make the most logical sense if you like trends uh, picking a champion. Um, my gold picks as they're standing right now are Kansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Houston. Uh, I think you got there's some arguments that can be had, but they check a lot of the boxes that you're looking for. Kansas is probably the most shaky one of those, but they check a lot of boxes. It'll to me, it'll become down to their health uh, and March Madness if they're going to have a shot chance. Now that's seven teams right there. All seven of those teams feel like to me they have the capability of making the Elite Eight. They have that capability. Uh, and then I got my silver picks, and that comes down to Baylor, Creighton, Iowa State. And then I changed one up today. Um, so when I come down here on my most recent one, uh, yeah, so for my silver picks, I've got Creighton, Iowa State, Marquette, Baylor, and then brand new up here because Auburn jumped in to the top five of the BPI and they finally have some quad one games. Auburn looks a lot more promising than they did. So they're starting to check a lot of boxes that previous national champions have had. This is a few box check is really my silver tier. I think this is a good group of teams. These all feel like Sweet 16 with the potential to make the lead eight is really the way that I feel about these teams. And then my bronze picks. These are things that I don't think they're likely to make a run, but they could make the Sweet 16. They could do whatever. Um, they Most of these teams have high ceilings and low floors. Um, so then I'm looking at this group. I've got Texas. I've got Kentucky. I've got Alabama. I got Illinois. I got Duke. I got BYU. Um, those to me are all interesting, interesting teams to be taking a look at here. Um, but yeah, those are my 18 teams I'm taking a look at. All of them have a legit chance to make the sweet 16. Um, but for two of them, it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, that's just math here. And the bracket has a way of, you know, sorting that thing out most of the time. So guys, what do you think? Am I crazy? I mean, I, I think those are all solid options, David, but it is March Madness. So upsets, Cinderella stories. Let's get into it with Isaac and take a look at those mid-major options. And we welcome to the show, Mr. Isaac Bourne of Mid-Major Madness. He is, of course, sitting right now at the American Conference Championship in Fort Worth, Texas, where the UAB Blazers just took down the Temple Owls, one of the more surprising stories that we've had in all the chaos uh, over the last 48 hours uh, with all the conference tournaments. I'm telling you right now, the tournament conference tournaments, if this is the precursor to what this tournament's going to be, it's going to be a nuts week. But Isaac, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. Excited to talk about this bracket. I've been waiting for this all year and it's, it's finally out. It's it's like Christmas for me. Well, you seem like the perfect guy for us to ask, you know, who do you like as somebody to upset this field, drive everybody crazy and, you know, bust 97 percent of brackets uh, in this thing? What team are you circling to cause the most damage there out of the mid-major ranks? Well, I mean, there are there are a lot of th there are a lot of teams in here that you could you could consider as these bracket busters because you've got teams like Grand Canyon and McNeese who started off the year really hot. McNeese finished off the year really hot with a you know, Southland Tournament Championship. And I guess you could say the same with Grand Canyon winning the WAC just a minute ago, or just a little, uh, yet last night, I mean. 
but I mean, you've also you've got a bunch of these like lower seeded um, mid majors or like not lower seeded in the the eleven seeds and the twelve seeds, and those seeds those guys can really win. But if you're looking at like fifteen and fourteen seeds, I really like Morehead State as a big matchup for Illinois, just because they're w very well coached with Preston Spradlin, and they also bring in uh, Riley Minix, who when in my time watching Riley Minix, I've never seen him, you know, have a hard matchup. So. Yeah, I know for sure. I trust me, all those teams you just named are teams that have definitely been on my radar all season. At least Moorhead State definitely popped on my radar after they won the Ohio Valley. Very good team there. Isaac, the most popular seed line uh, when we see someone's bracket being bust uh, the last couple of years. Last year, we didn't have one, but a 12 was beaten a five on a regular basis. What 12 seed are you the most interested in? I, I got one in my head. James Madison obviously was a really good team to start the year. Everybody says James Madison, and yes, that's a very good team. But one team that I just I just talked about them, one team I want to raise is Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon is a team. They beat San Diego State earlier in the year. They did fall off a little bit in whack play, losing, I think it was three in a row um, against uh, Seattle and um, against Seattle and some other teams in Tarleton State. But they're a team that can compete with Power 5 competition and have shown that this year with, with that San Diego State win plus just uh, the ma the whack dominance that they've had. Okay. So other than that, you know, is there anybody that you think might not be as popular, you know, so to speak, out of the more popular teams that have been picked that you're interested in? Well, I'm looking over the bracket here. And first of all, I I've got to mention St. Peter's. I, I know that every year, or we just a couple years ago, we're just a couple years removed from their Cinderella run. They beat my Kentucky Wildcats. And, um, you know, we're just a couple years removed from that, and it was just a great team. But one team that I really, I really see as a team that probably should have been a little bit higher, but didn't, is coming out of Conference USA, Western Kentucky. And you know, that might be my Kentucky bias showing. But Western Kentucky plays fast. They play on the their Ken Palm rated is the fastest paced team in the country. They score very quickly, and so they can be a problem with for this Marquette team if they if they can play into the rhythm of their offense. Yeah, so one of the big ones that I picked in our kind of mid-major of going over conference champs was UAB. Um, obviously, kind of a little bit of an upset there, um, them winning that conference. And, you know, I feel like they have a solid matchup starting out against San Diego State, a team that a lot of people weren't sure where they were going to land. So what are your thoughts on that team, knowing that a lot of people kind of undervalued them? Well, San Diego State is a team that you saw that last year, them going on the way on the, all the way to the national championship. They're a team that can get hot. And you've seen you, they bring they brought back Lamont Butler, Darion Trammell, guys like that, who um, and also Jaden Ledee totally forgot about him, who, you know, up for national player of the year. Now, San Diego State's got a bunch of good players. But then you also look at UAB, who I literally just watched come off the court and um, with Yaxel, Yaxel Lindenborg and Eric Gaines, Lindenborg has come out of nowhere as a Juco product, but he plays with power five skill. And you see that in his ability to uh, stretch the floor and his ability to run the court at six foot nine. And then you've got Eric Gaines, who, uh, while while not maybe a perfect point guard for this team, is one of the best scorers in the American Conference. And when he gets hot, he gets hot. And then I would be remiss without even talking about um, basket with a, without even talking about Vasquez, who today dropped 29 points in the American Conference Final, and this team is dangerous. And I would be very scared if I was San Diego State. But at the same time, it'll be a really good matchup between Ladie and Lindenborg in the in the front court. Okay, so you mentioned Western Kentucky, uh, and we know over the last couple of seasons, I believe it's three seasons in a row now, a 15 is upset at two. Um, one of the teams that I circled and I'm more interested in is uh, South Dakota State. Now, I don't believe they've won uh, an NCAA tournament game before. I may be mistaken. They might have won one, but it's been a minute since they have. They were picked, I believe, two years ago pretty heavily to beat Providence. With South Dakota State playing Iowa State, do you see any hope for the Jackrabbits? Because this is a team that's been consistently getting to the tournament out of the summit. Do you think there's any chance that that might be the 15 over the two this year? Well, it's March, so uh, that's all I can say. You you never know what can happen. My takes have gone from bad to worse as the month goes on. I predicted that Temple would get knocked out in the first round of the of the American, and here we are. 
So, but my take here, unfortunately, is that I don't think South Dakota State can can quite compete with Iowa State, seeing as they're very hot right now, just coming off success in the um in the Big Ten, not the Big Twelve um championship. And so you've got a good Iowa State team that's peaking at the right time, and then South Dakota State, who yes, they're a great team, is just not one of the premier mid majors in my in my head. But like I said, I. This it's still 50 50 in my head just because of the March craziness that goes on. Certainly. Um, I'm going to ask you one more in that corner of the region. I'm going to hand it over to Maddie for the final question. But there's the Missouri Valley situation. Obviously, Indiana State got left out of this thing. I want to ask this question in two parts. Um, how unfortunate is it for Indiana State? And you think it was a crime against humanity that Indiana State was left out? And then for the Drake Bulldogs, what are the odds of them making a run in this thing? Well, last weekend I was in attendance to see at the Missouri Valley Conference Championship to see Drake uh, take down Indiana State. And, you know, the press conference room afterwards with uh, Indiana State coach Schertz was uh, he was definitely upset. And both him and then later in the, later on in the interview sessions, uh, Coach DeVries were both very adamant that Drake uh, that the MVC was a two bid league. Unfortunately, with recent events and, you know, you've, we've seen so yeah. many bid stealers. Uh, Indiana State just barely knocks it out. Now, I did hear that they are the highest, they have the highest net rating of any team out of the field, which is incredible to me. But with they're the third team out, I don't think I, I, it's, it's very unfortunate. I thought, and my, if you were going to look at my personal opinion, I think that with the, um, I thought that they would get in just with Avila and his just, you know, rise to prominence. But they will be a dangerous NIT team. I'll say that. Certainly. Then, Maddie? So everybody's always looking for the upset of all upsets. So out of these picks for the one sixteen seeding, who do you think has the best chance of? But they don't make you make a prediction that a sixteen is going to beat a one. That that's only. I don't know. Just just ever. who has the best chance? I I don't want to put that on anybody. But if somebody was going to pick it, going to bet all their money on that, which one would you go with? As far as the play in teams, unfortunately, I don't really see too many of these teams as upset uh, upset teams. They don't play. W one thing you're looking for in upset teams is teams that play fast, shoot the three really well, and when they get hot, they can go they can go on big runs and win games. And you no, know, these teams that I'm looking at aren't those types of teams. But if you're looking at the teams that you know are automatically in, which are Longwood and Stetson, I'm looking at both of these teams. Obviously. I don't think Stetson can beat UConn because I don't think anyone can beat UConn. But I raised you Longwood, who has had who had who came out of uh, you know very they came out of conference tournament you know with high point in it and teams like that who were just incredibly talented. And Longwood comes out of that very strong conference, and I'm kind of selfishly hoping that it's Longwood because uh, it's in Memphis and that's where I'll be, and it'll be a really good way to um, really good thing to cover. But Longwood started off very hot this season. Um, toned down a little bit once they got to conference play, but they seem like the perfect candidate to be that knockout team, especially with a Houston team that, you know, just lost in the big 12 semis. Okay. So with Longwood, you do their coach. Um, you do know his backstory, what team he was a part of when he was a 16 seed, right? Their coach. I'm not at quite sure I do. Their coach at Longwood was part of the UMBC staff that upset Virginia as an assistant coach. I cannot remember his name right now but he was on that staff for UMBC. And so I, I'm just super, that's why I started pointing as soon as you said Longwood, I'm going to have to look up the coach's name again real fast. Um, hold on one second. The glory of the internet right here just escaped my head, but that's one of those facts that has stayed in my head for forever. Uh, while I'm looking it up, wanted to let everybody know, Isaac, where um, where they can find you at. Well, my name is my name is Isaac Bourne, as you can see. Isaac Bourne, as you can see, B-O-U-R-N-E, like Jason Bourne. And you can find me on Twitter at Isaac Bourne 11. And then, um, you know, you can find my articles at, online uh, at Midmajor Madness and, you know, go give those a read if you want, if you would like. Uh, I have a lot of content coming out at this time of year. Uh, you know, it's March. We sleep in May, as I as everyone always says. Yeah. And the name was, by the way, it was Griff Aldrich is the coach who was Griff part of the UMBC. Yep. He was part of that UMBC team. He was on the coaching staff that upset the Virginia Cavaliers. Isaac, thank you so much for joining us. And I will let you get out of Fort Worth and back home, man. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. Of course. Thanks, Isaac. Good talking to you.
Guys, let's pick some games. Now, you know, most people start out in, you know, wherever the number one overall seed is, but this is an SEC podcast. And so we're going to start out where the top ranked or the top seeded SEC team is, and that's Tennessee Volunteers. And we welcome to the show from Section YY8, Negative Nice. How you doing today, man? Good. What's going on, everybody? Well, you know, I think it's a good day for all of us. We got eight SEC teams into the field, which was my prediction preseason. So liking where we're sitting right now, Tennessee, I think, has got a pretty fun bracket to be in. Um, but like, let's talk about this Tennessee team just a little bit uh, before we get rocking here. Now, obviously, things did not go the way that Tennessee fans wanted it to go in the SEC tournament. Are you kind of, you know, is there kind of an attitude of a little bit of nervousness after that SEC tournament, or do you think this team bounces back well? I, I think this team, I I want to think this team bounces back. They got too many veterans on this team that have been around the block with Vescovy, Triple J, Adu, all these guys have been around the block. And uh, Jemai Meshack came out in the press conference after after the loss to Mississippi State the other day and said, we will not feel like this again. So that was encouraging. Um, I'm hopeful that they can bounce back because let's just face it, they they were pretty terrible on Thursday – or sorry, Friday afternoon against Mississippi State. Um, so I am a little concerned about – how they've played the past couple games after they clinched the SEC regular season title against South Carolina. Is it fixable? Yes. Um, so, I mean, we're fans. There's always going to be a little bit of concern there, obviously, but I'm hopeful that the veterans on this team and the, and the coaching staff is able to, you know, erase this from the guys' minds. Hey, it's the SEC tournament. You probably weren't going to be a one seed anyways from the sound of it. So, Let's just forget about it and move on and, and focus on the next two games we got. Absolutely. Uh, guys, do you have any questions before I jump into a little bit deeper on Tennessee? So my biggest thing, um, you know, I've, I've been listening to a lot of a lot of basketball talk these last few days. And one of the biggest things I heard was, you know, to talk about Dalton Connect and how he kind of underperformed in that um, SEC tournament. But they think this is going to be kind of his turning point to where he's just an absolute superstar in the NCAA tournament because he doesn't want to end a season like that. Um, so do you have any predictions on Dalton Connect going into the tournament? He – he, the whole team didn't play well Friday. He didn't play well Friday. Um, he missed a wide-open dunk at the end of the game, and you could just see his body language. It's like, I can't even get a dunk to go in. He still had 14 points, which – for most other people, it would be a great day. But um, Clark Kellogg said on the selection show when Tennessee's name came up that the the nation will finally see Dalton connect. And I think he bounces back. He He's, from everything I've heard uh, from over there on campus, is the guy works extremely hard. All he cares about is basketball. They rarely see him out um, on the town uh, on, at night. <laughs> so he's always in the gym. So. Um, I'm hopeful that he can bounce back because if he does, the nation is going to see what we've all seen around the SEC uh, the past four months. Uh, not that the nation hasn't seen him, but this is the bigger stage than than earlier in the season. But um, I think he can. I think he will. All right, Caleb. Yeah, I think going for me, you know, is there any worry about, you know, what people have said in the past about Rick Barnes in March? Is there any worry about anything like that happening or? I mean, I touched on this last week, and I don't know if Nice heard me talk about this now, but everybody's got a different path. And took Scott Drew 18 years to win a national championship. But go ahead, uh, Nice, by all I, means. Yeah, you know, we, we, some of our, us in our group, not even our podcast, but some others um, that watch the games um, that are fans of Tennessee, like at some point we keep putting ourselves in these positions of two seed, three seed. Um, at some point, you think things have got to go Tennessee's way and they're going to kick down that door and make a run. They're going to get hot instead of running into Loyola, Chicago, or whoever it may be, you know, Oregon State, um, Florida Atlantic. I mean, it's just over and over and over. I think the last five conference or NCAA tournaments, Tennessee's lost to a lower seed. So at some point, you would think law of averages is going to say – this isn't going to happen this year. We're hopeful it's this year, but that is in – as soon as Tennessee lost Friday, that was all everybody was talking about. 
around Knoxville, around the SEC was here's Rick Barnes. Here we go again. It's March. And the numbers don't lie. He's an average coach in March. I don't know why. I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't think the guy forgets how to coach when it when the calendar turns to March. But um, as Big Montana on our show says, when the grass starts growing, Tennessee basketball loses. And and listen, this isn't just a, a Rick Barnes thing at Tennessee. Let's let's be honest. It's it goes back decades. Jerry Green. Had a great team in Knoxville at UT, and we lost to an underseated North Carolina team. Um, how many times did did Bruce Pearl come up just a bit short in the NCAA tournament when he was here? Uh, we had a chance to beat Michigan in the Sweet 16 when Conzo Martin was here. We didn't get it done. I mean, it's just over and over and over. So, is this the year? I sure hope so. I think our draw is pretty good, but. Tennessee's just got to go down there and kick that door in and, and get through it. They just, they're just going to have to win it for once. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, let's go through and let's start picking some games. So obviously the team that Tennessee drew uh, is a team that Kentucky's very familiar with. Uh, <laughs> and that is the St. Peter's Peacocks. Uh, 19 wins on the season for the Peacocks. Not the greatest offense you're ever going to see, but they do play decent defense uh, for the uh, for the Peacocks. Guys, let's just run through this real quick. This should be a pretty easy pick, but what stands out to you about the Peacocks in this matchup and how many points does Dalton Connect put up in this game? <laughs> Maddie, we'll start with you if you want to go ahead. I mean, for me, it's kind of one of those, obviously everybody knows the Peacocks from the Tennessee game, but other than that, they've kind of been a blip on the radar this season. Um, I don't think it's anything that the volunteers aren't going to be able to compete with. Um, as far as Dalton Connect goes, I'm hoping he has a bit of a revenge game. Let people know that he's here to play. Let's let's see him go for at least 35. Let's see it. Caleb, so I'm guessing, Maddie, you're picking Tennessee, right? I'm going to go with Tennessee. I already made a bet that they're my national championship winner, so you're going to see me pick a lot of Tennessee this round. <laughs> you picking the daggum wow. sports bet. <laughs> you're, you're confident. Caleb, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, it's like you said – you know, I think after this loss in the SEC tournament, you're gonna see this Tennessee team bounce back. You know, as much as you, I'm a fan of the Cinderella stories. Enjoyed seeing St. Peter's two years ago knock off Kentucky. I just like like David said, we were talking before. This isn't that same St. Peter's team that we saw two years ago. This is a totally different team. That like 19 wins, not the greatest record. So. I don't think it's going to necessarily be close. You know, it'd be interesting. That would be, I think, a very big surprise in this tournament overall. But I think you're going to see Tennessee move on in this one pretty easily. Okay. Nace, who do you got? Uh, obviously, I'm going to take Tennessee. Right. We're um, all taking Tennessee here. <laughs> I mean, I, I looked St. Peter's numbers up just a little bit earlier before I got on. Like you said, they're not very good offensively. No. They rank near the bottom or toward the bottom in a lot of offensive categories. Um I don't know much else about him, but I can't imagine this is a game where Jonas Adu can't step up and and take control of the game down low and free up connect out front. I think Dalton can score probably as much as he wants in this game, but I think you'll see him score around 25. Hopefully they can get him out toward the end of the game and not have to rely on him. Um, I saw the line was 19 and a half Tennessee, so I think they, they can cover this one and, and walk into the round of 32. I'm going to make it a 4-0 here. Player to watch out, though, that Tennessee's going to want to stop scoring Washington uh, 16.5 points a game. Uh, also, they got a pretty decent, not great, uh, three-point shooter in Marcus Randolph is another player that Tennessee is going to want to watch out for. So we're all moving the balls on here. Caleb, I hope that you're keeping track for us, please. Uh, thank you. I don't want to get lost in the middle of this. But <laughs> let's go on and let's talk about Texas. And do you like the Longhorns over either Virginia or Colorado State? What are you guys thinking there in that one? I'm going to go with Texas. Um, they've had a little bit of trouble in this last little bit of the season. Um, but both Virginia and Colorado State, I mean, Virginia has been a little bit better as of late. So I think if they win that game, they'll give Texas a little bit more trouble. Um, but as far as the matchup goes, I like Texas in that one. Okay. Caleb, who do you got? Yeah, I think I got to go with Texas in this one. You you look at that Texas roster, like Maddie said, they've been struggled here of late. But – one guy on their roster that you've got to look at that's a very experienced guy, has been in the tournament several years before, is Max Admus. Yep. He's a guy that's very familiar with the tournament, You know, took that jump from Oral Roberts to Texas, and is looking to make a run here. 
I would say if you didn't mention him, I was. Yeah, there's like a trio of three good guards here between all three of these teams. Isaiah Stevens on Colorado State, 16.5 points per game. Then another excellent guard uh, out of um, <clears throat> Reese Beekman, one of the best guards in the country out of Virginia. You're not going to see a ton of offense out of that Virginia team. Very slow, very deliberate, very determined defensive play out of Virginia. But I am with you. I like Max. I'm going Texas. Nice, who do you got? And see if we make another 4 0 sweep here. I, I think it's 4-0. I like Texas against either one of these teams, Colorado State or Virginia. The Colorado State-Virginia game, I think, um, I, it's kind of a toss-up to me. I don't know a ton about either of those teams. Just looking at their at their numbers overall, they're fairly even. Um, I think Virginia probably wins. They're playing a little bit better right now um, and moves on to face Texas. And then we've got a uh, Rick Barnes Bowl 3 coming up, Texas and Tennessee. I was about to say that's a that's a storyline creating itself right there in the round of 32 uh, with Texas and Tennessee playing each other there. Uh, let's go with this a little bit quicker if we can through what's north of them. Let's jump to the number three game there between Creighton and Akron. Um, there's a trio of really good guards for the Jays, and I'm just going to lay this out here. Like the Jays are a very, very good team when it comes to offense, and they have multiple ways that they can get the job done. Um, they're very balanced, efficient team, but also they're going to be one of the slower teams we see in the tournament. They finished second place in the Big East. They finished second place in the Hall of Fame Classic earlier season. They got wins over Alabama, UConn, and Marquette. Um, they got several guys, like I said, who contribute. The biggest concern for me when it comes to Creighton is the defensive numbers are good, but I, I feel like a solid offense could possibly take advantage of that defense uh, with the pace that uh, Creighton wants to play at and how they want to control the game. But, guys, how do you see this one? Akron's kind of fun. They're an interesting one. The Max kind of down this year. What are you guys thinking? I'm going to go with Creighton in this one. Um, one of those teams that we talked about earlier earlier in the year that um, they were going to be a hard team come March. Um, and I don't think that's changed a lot. We've seen some of those younger players grow into more leadership roles, and I think they're going to take that uh, head on in the tournament. So Absolutely. I'm going to go Creighton in this one. Caleb, what do you got? Uh, I like Creighton as well. All right, so that's three on Creighton. Caleb, I'm assuming you're going Creighton also. Yeah, I was about to say when you look at this Creighton team, two two names that you know stand out to me that you got to focus on is, is Shireman and Colt Brenner. You know, those two guys have been leading this Creighton team all season, and I think you're going to see them help them make a run this season. All right, so who do you guys have against a possibly healthy Kansas team and Bucky Ball for out of Sanford? Here, this one's one of the more intriguing matchups we got. Any thoughts on this one as a possible upset? I niece is ready to talk about it. Go ahead, man. Uh, so, um, my former high school baseball coach went to the Sanford ETSU game last week in Asheville. He says pick Sanford. Um, he saw them in person, thought they were really, really good team. I think if Kansas is healthy, though, I think they win. But this could be a very intriguing game. But I'm going to cautiously take the Jayhawks. All right, Maddie, who do you got? You know, I'll agree with Nice there. Um, especially if they're healthy. If they're healthy, I'm I'm going Kansas, no regards. Um, if not, it, it's gonna be I think it is gonna be a closer game than everybody expects, but I think Kansas has got this one pretty easily. Caleb, who do you have before I say something crazy? Yeah, I think in this one it, it's hard to go against the grain with a, a traditional Kansas team that, you know. In a 4-13 matchup, this should be no problem for them. Like, it, it all goes back to they, they need to be healthy. And with that, I, I'm going to follow the suit of cautiously, cautiously optimistic with Kansas in this one. Okay, so I'm going to pick uh, I'm gonna pick Sanford in this one. Uh, if Hunter Dickinson's not back, uh, I don't know how to, how to go with this one, but I'm going to pick Sanford and be the lone rider here. But uh, Bucky Ball is a lot of fun. They get a lot of got a great assist to turnover ratio there, and they love to run up and down that court. But let's go ahead and move on to the next game. Uh, Gonzaga versus McNeese State. How about that for a matchup? Anybody taking the Cowboys here with Will Wade? He will never get off this show ever. <laughs> and we'll never not be able to not talk about Will Wade. Um, but what, who, who, who's thinking here? Who, who do you got? You know, we kind of talked about it earlier, David. I never once thought I would say that I am – cheering for a Will Wade team. <laughs> but I'm going to go with the Cowboys here. I feel like Gonzaga is a little overrated. I think the name kind of got them the spot uh, where they're at in this one. So I'm going to go make these stay with the upset. Caleb? Yeah, you know, this is one of those five twelve matchups. And, you know, like you said, it doesn't seem like the Will Wade talk is going to stop. 
you know, it seems like right when we think we get rid of him, he's out of the SEC. Here he comes back again with McNeese. And, you know, I'm liking the McNeese, McNeese in this matchup. So give me McNeese with the up, up, upset of Gonzaga. Nice. Who you got, man? Man, am I going to go off the rails and not pick with you guys on one? Uh, I don't know. This is a tough one. I mean, like Maddie said, Gonzaga, a um, little down this year, not not, uh, not as good as they have been. Probably a little overseeded, I think. There was several other teams I felt like that were overseeded, but they were one of them. But I never thought we'd be talking about Will Wade in this capacity again. I've never liked that guy, and I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to pick McNeese State. Oh, my gosh. We're going to make it an upset. Oh, yeah, we're going to all do it. Uh, yeah, no, I'm actually going to go McNeese State in this one. I like it. Uh, Shahada Wells, 17.8 points per game, and you, this team rebounds, too. They actually have won the glass in the Southland all throughout the course of the season. They've beaten Power Six teams before. Give me the Cowboys. I can't believe that's a clean, sweet upset there. I thought we'd have a little controversy. All right, let's jump to the 8-9 game here before we just all move Purdue on in the number one matchup uh, there. But who do you like, Utah State or T TCU? Whoever wants to jump you in, go take for it. TCU in this one. Um, I feel like they've kind of been up and down this season. Um, but I feel like they always play well when it comes to March. So they've got some experienced players on that team. Um, Give me the Horn Frogs. Caleb. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Caleb. Oh, I was going to say, you look at this team, this two teams that, you know, very similar um, rosters and like how they're built with the, the schedule and their, their how their schedule went. Ultimately, in this one, I'm going to go with Utah State in this one. The the Aggies moving on for me. Nice. I'm, I'm going to take the Aggies. Uh, Cinder. This is a Cinderella team. They back in the summer, they only had four scholarship players on the roster, used the transfer portal. Um, they've had a remarkable season. I think they won what 15, 16 in a row at one point. I'm gonna take the Aggies in this one, but it should be a fun matchup. Yeah, definitely. So uh Utah Utah State's a team that I'm also on board with here. I'm gonna go the Aggies as well. Um, they've been one of my favorites out of the Mountain West all season. Uh great Aboro um is a talented, talented player down low for the Aggies. So I like that. We're all moving Purdue on, right? Go ahead. Did did we pick South Carolina, Oregon? I was gonna oh, say we we, we skipped one. South Carolina and yeah. Oregon. Yeah, sorry about that. Let's, let's jump off. South Carolina, Oregon. Who's who we got in that one? Because we're all moving Purdue on, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. South Carolina, Oregon, who do we like? I'm going to go South Carolina. As long as they, you know, play like they've been playing um, their better games, we'll not talk about their last game in the SEC tournament. But outside of that, any other South Carolina team, I feel like would beat the Oregon Ducks nine out of ten times in the game. Absolutely. Caleb? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to go opposite of you here, Maddie, and go with Oregon Ducks in this one. Give me Dante and Kusnard in this one, a guard center combo for Oregon that, you know, they're leading the team right now, averaging 16 and 15 points a game. Um, Lamont Paris has done a fantastic job with the South Carolina team, but I, I don't think he gets it done this year. Nice. Who you got? I'm going to take the Gamecocks. Um, I think this could be another uh, intriguing matchup, though. Oregon's playing really well right now. Uh, won several games in a row to get to the – Pac-12 title game last night and brought the title home to to get into the tournament. So, um, you know, playing really well right now. Uh, South Carolina has been a little iffy here the last couple of weeks, but I think they play in a better conference. They played a tougher schedule. I'm going to go with the Gamecocks. That's fair. And I'm also going to go with the Gamecocks in this one. I can't believe I didn't pick that one as an upset because Oregon's playing really hot ball right now. And, you know, overall, they – shoot the three decently, but I, I like South Carolina a little bit more complete. I like BJ Mack as one of the big players coming out of South Carolina to get the job done. And also Gray is playing excellent basketball right now. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go South Carolina as well. All right. So moving on here, let's go back down to Tennessee. We got Tennessee and Texas. Who do you guys got in this one? We got the Longhorns or the Vols. We'll go quick around the horn. We'll start with Nice here. I am going to cautiously take Tennessee. This has got all the ingredients for one of these wow. classic Tennessee upsets in the NCAA tournament. Um, I, I just think Tennessee's better than Texas. Um, I mean, Texas has got some good wins on the season, but they also have quite a few losses. They did play in the Big 12, but 
Um, I I just think Tennessee is the better team here. Going to have a little bit of a home court advantage being four hours away in Charlotte. I'm going to take Tennessee. Guys, who do you got? I'm going to go Tennessee as well. Um, I think really, you know, the the secret ingredient there for the Longhorns, like we talked about, Max Abemus. Um, I think Tennessee's defense is going to be able to shut him down. Texas isn't, isn't going to know what to do with that as long as Tennessee's playing ball the way that we've Watch them play this season, so I'm going to go with the balls. All right, Caleb, who do you got? Yeah, and this one I'm going to go with Tennessee. You know, I, I think like we said, you're going to have Dalton connect, you know, bounce back from that SEC tournament. But then you can't forget a guy named Zakai Ziegler as well. He's a guy that has impressed me with just the way he's bounced back from the injury last season. And I, I think the balls get it done here against number seven, Texas. Key matchup in my mind in this one is going to be backcourt versus backcourt, and I think Tennessee's got the better backcourt, especially Santiago Vescovi. Please steps up that game just a little bit. Um, I We're think- not asking for much, just it's a like, little bit. It's like one extra three a game. Um, <laughs> just one. <laughs> just one extra three. Uh, that, that's all we're asking for. But, yeah, I'm going to go Tennessee here, and I'm going to go ahead and advance into the Sweet 16. All right, between South Carolina and Creighton, who do we like? I like Creighton. Oh, I'm going to go Creighton as well. Caleb? Yeah, greatness here too. We are in too much of a mind. We're not causing enough chaos in our bracket right <laughs> now. But uh, yeah, I'm also with Creighton on that one. So we'll go ahead and move them on. All right. So we ended up advancing Kansas, even though I said Sanford, and we got them facing McNeese State. Do we have a double digit seed in the Sweet 16 against the Jayhawks? Uh, whoever wants to jump in, go ahead. Who was your pick first? David, you want chaos? Give me knees in this one, taking down Kansas. There we go. Chaos. Give me chaos. <laughs> Give me madness. I have chaos, but not in this bracket. I'm going to take a healthy Jayhawks team. I okay. like Bill Self. All right. Fair enough. Maddie. Yep. That's my hold up here is with Kansas. If they're healthy, I'm going to take them over McNeese. All right, Caleb, you're going to get to break a tie here because I'm taking McNeese. Uh, so, because there's normally one team that surprises us here. So, Caleb, uh, do you like a healthy Kansas team or do you like uh, McNeese State with Will Wade to make the Sweet 16? You know, I, I like the idea of the, the chaos here, but, you know, with a healthy Kansas team, I think you've got to realistically move on the healthy Kansas Will team. Is- consistent if anything else i understand that all right let's go real fast and let's pick our winner between utah state and purdue who do we like in this one i'm going purdue in this one um zach ed i think he's going to be dominant for the first few games before he gasses out so i i think they're still safe in this one with him all right niece i agree purdue i don't think anybody for the aggies can guard ed yeah, fair enough. Caleb, what do you got? Same here, same mindset there. Zach Eady, he's just too much to handle right now until, you know, we're two games in here. You know, once you get further down, you think about the gas playing the the games so so close together. But right now, I think you see Purdue moving on. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with there. Uh, Aboro versus um, ED is going to be the matchup down low, and I think ED is by far the guy that's going to take care of business there. So we got Purdue moving in to the Sweet 16. So we got Tennessee taking on Creighton in the Sweet 16. Nice, I'll start with you because this is your team. Uh, this is a really good, you know, collective three-point shooting team, Creighton team, but who do you have in this one? I was going to say, I d- was looking at Creighton while we were talking about him a minute ago, nearly 11 three-pointers a game, so they can shoot it from the outside. Um, Tennessee has struggled the past couple games defending the three against Kentucky, um, not not as much as against Mississippi State, but um, – I, I just like Tennessee in this game. I think they're just a hair better than Creighton. Creighton's a really good basketball team. They play in a good conference. They've been a good team for a long time. Um, I just I, I'm I said on the show a couple weeks ago I'm going to go down with the Vols. So give me the Vols. Okay, very good. Now I know that Maddie is going to be on board because she just revealed who her national champion was. <laughs> uh, so Caleb, who do you got? Yeah, this. Like they said, this is a good three-point shooting Creighton team. We we know what they can do. Um, I, I'm going to go with Tennessee in this one just because I, we know what they can do, what they've done with the regular season. And I'll be interested to see the matchups between, you know, you have Connect, Shireman, you have Colt Ziegler, all, Colt Brenner, all those guys, uh, Adu for – Tennessee, it's going to be a great matchup, and I think it could be one that's going to be a close matchup, but I I think Tennessee finds a way to pull it out. 
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and advance Creighton for me personally, but um, for you guys, you know, obviously the group vote is Tennessee. I understand that and I'm with it, but like there is a lot that Creighton has to offer and I personally just don't like this draw for Tennessee. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to go Creighton in this one. Um, nothing against Tennessee. I do like them a lot, but that's this is a tough, tough game for them and a matchup that's a little unfavorable. All right, let's go for we got Kansas taking on Purdue on the other side of the Sweet 16. Who do we like? I'm going to go Kansas on this one. Um, I think we kind of get to that point where Zach Eady gas is out. Um, you know, my big thing is taking it back to that Arkansas exhibition game. Obviously, Arkansas was very back and forth this season. Um, but you, we saw what happened when um, you get get a quick team with them. I think with a healthy uh, Jayhawks team, they can outrun them make them tired, and I don't think they're going to be able to last that many games in a row. Okay, interesting. All right, Caleb, who do you got? I'm going to take Purdue for one more round in this one. I, I want to see the matchup between Edie and Hunter Dickinson. I think that's going to be a fantastic matchup oh, down low to, to see um, who wins that matchup, and I think that's where we mentioned a healthy team. That how healthy is Hunter Dickinson, and does that allow him to play his best against Zach Edie? Nice. who do you got? This is kind of turning into the Maui bracket, I've noticed, by the way. Uh, yeah, I, I was just looking up. I couldn't remember if Kansas and uh, Purdue played each other in Maui. They didn't, that I that I can find. Oh, but God, That one, yeah. Yeah, they um, – I think a healthy Kansas team poses a pretty big threat to Purdue. Um, I, I just don't know how healthy Hunter Dickinson is and will he be able to withstand um, – a uh, Zach Eady that gets a lot of favorable calls sometimes from the official uh, from the officials. Um, I'm going to take Purdue, but I think this could be a really tight game um, if Kansas is healthy. But okay. give me Purdue. Yeah, I'm with that. Uh, I'm going to go Purdue as well. And my X factor for Purdue is really not. I'm not even thinking about Zach Eady really in this matchup versus that Dickinson Eady matchup. Um, what I'm thinking here is the three point shooting and can Kansas keep up with that because they can't shoot the three very well on this Kansas team and guys like Braden Smith uh, and other guys if he's healthy uh, for Purdue. I think Purdue's three point shooting is going to be really difficult for them to deal with because your options are guard Eady or guard the three when you play Purdue. And I don't know if Kansas offense is going to keep up. So I've got Purdue in the elite eight when they're going to be facing the Tennessee volunteers who goes to the final four here, guys, who do you like? Anybody. <laughs> Nobody wants to go. I'll go. I'll go. Um, so Tennessee and Purdue, they faced each other in 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 Mau in the Maui tournament, Maui invitational back in November. Purdue got the best of Tennessee. It was almost like a football game in that game. It was so physical, so rough. Um, Tennessee got pushed around a little bit underneath. Jonas Adu, Tobe Awaka um got pushed around a little bit. Awaka has come on since then. He wasn't playing a whole lot back in back in Maui. He was coming off of an injury. Um he's playing more and more minutes has become has become more effective. So can Tennessee, can Jonas Adu, can uh, Tobe Awaka and possibly others uh in the in the low post uh limit Zach Eady and force Purdue to make some shots outside. Um, we know Tennessee's a really good defensive team. That to me, that's the key. If they can limit Edie and force Purdue to shoot outside, and Purdue's a very good shooting team, but we've seen in some of their losses this year, they've not shot very well from the outside. So I I don't know who to pick. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with my team. I'm gonna go with the Vols. I think they find a way to get the best of Zach Edie. You gotta look at this coaching matchup too. These are two coaches that every year come up short in March. Matt Painter, Rick Barnes. Um, so one of them, if they play each other, is going to get the monkey off their back and at least get to the final four in Arizona. I'm going to go with the Vols, um, but I can see another rock fight like we had in, in Maui back in November. Certainly so. I get the, I get the pick. Maddie, are you sure you want to pick with Tennessee? So, so to be fair, I made that bet on Tennessee before the SEC tournament even started. Saw the oh. odds, thought it was good. I was like, yeah, it's 10 bucks. We'll be, we'll be fine. <laughs> I can eat ramen for a meal if, if that's that's what it calls for. But my big thing, taking a look at it, taking a look at the numbers, it's going to be a battle at the free throw line. Um, like Nice mentioned earlier, you've got a lot of fouls on Tennessee, 17.4 on average per game. Purdue's at 
point forward. But I think as we get deeper into the tournament, eyes are going to be on the refs a lot more. So maybe some of those favorable favorable cause calls for Zach Eady don't go the way that they plan. So honestly, I'm going to go with the better free throw shooting team here. Um, and the team that I feel like is going to shoot more, I'm going to go with Purdue. Okay. Caleb, who do you got? Yeah, I think in this one, like good points from both sides there. Looking at it, I, I really think with the mention, we mentioned it before, you have Zach Eady that it, it's been game after game. I think by by the time we get to this point, you're going to see him gas a little bit. And like Maddie said, the better free throw, free throw shooting team in Tennessee here. And, you know, like Nice mentioned, these two teams, one of them is going to get this monkey off their back. And I think Rick, Rick Barnes gets, gets it done in this one and advances to the Final Four. You know, I really love, I really love the, uh, the, the, t- this matchup. If it's, if, if this is how it goes down, you got Painter who's never made the final four and you got Rick Barnes, who's trying to get, get back to the final four for the first time since he's been to Texas. Um, look, we're about to have a tiebreaker, Caleb. So you're going to have to figure it out here on this one, but I am going to go Purdue in this one. Um, this was the matchup I didn't want. I wanted Houston to be per, or I wanted Houston for Tennessee because I think Houston, Houston's a really good matchup for Tennessee in that mm-hmm. situation. This is not the one I wanted, but I did say earlier in this year that I think if Purdue and Tennessee played 10 times, Purdue would win six. Um, and that's kind of how I still feel that way. Let's see how far this goes. Um, but for me, I am going to go Purdue and I'm going to rely on, like I said, that extremely talented shooting option and the difficulty you have to deal with when you guard either Zach Eady or you have to guard the perimeter uh, with this Purdue team and a lot of their Zoom action that they run. So I'm going to go Purdue. Caleb, who's our who's in our final four? I'm going to stick with Tennessee in this one. Okay. All right. So Caleb, oh, man. there we go. There we go. I don't think it's a bad pick. Like you could flip a coin. I almost was looking for a quarter over here uh, trying to pick this one because this is this is a complicated matchup. But all right, niece, let everybody know where they can find the best Tennessee podcast out there, which is Section YY8. So we're uh, anywhere you can get podcasts, Section YY8 podcast. We have a YouTube channel at Section YY8. We're on all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, X, Twitter, whatever it's called these days, um, at Section YY8 there. So uh, if you're a Tennessee fan listening and you haven't checked us out yet, be sure to give us a listen. I'm going to be recording our selection show special here shortly, so uh, be on the lookout for that. Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming here today, man. Yeah, glad to be here. Good luck on the vaults. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) And we welcome to the show from the Crimson Crossover uh, podcast, Caleb's, or sorry, Christian Sykes. Got too many C names in one room, but he is a huge Alabama fan with a great podcast over there. Christian, how are you doing today? Man, I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Uh, doing excellent. You know, how are you feeling about this draw for Alabama in the tournament? Yeah, I, I think it's very favorable. Charleston comes in ranked 176th in defense, 58th in offense. Uh, I think it's a really good test for Alabama as far as um, trying to get their confidence back. Obviously, you've seen over the last few games, Alabama's kind of struggled a little bit offensively. So I think it's a really good get back opportunity. And then obviously St. Mary's um, in the ne- potential next round. So uh, I, I'm I'm not upset with it. I think there's an opportunity for Alabama to have a chance to make a run. Um, just have to figure out some things. Yeah, for certainly. So, um, guys, I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask Christian some more questions. I keep doing that, but do you guys have anything for Christian real fast on this draw or this Alabama team? So, Christian, one of our biggest things um, we've all kind of taken a liking to Grand Canyon and what they're about to do. What are your thoughts on the potential of Alabama playing Grand Canyon in one of the upset games? Yeah, I, I, my initial gut bracket, I have Grand Canyon and Alabama playing. So um, I I think they're a very good team and they'll present a lot of problems, especially in their front court uh, for Alabama. And I I don't know. I just, I, one thing you got to remember about this Alabama team and get like trying to play or, um, kind of try to plan for them is it's really hard to plan for an Alabama team with less than a day's worth of work. Like they have, it's a quick turnaround. And if they haven't already pre-scouted us, um, which I assume some of their assistants will be doing, um, it's going to be tough to try to install stuff to, to run against Alabama. I, I think if Alabama gets out of the first round, I think they make it to the sweet 16 just because of that fact alone. That's fair enough, Caleb. Yeah. Nothing here on, 
on Alabama. Okay, I've got one for you, Christian, because we talked about this the last time you were on the show. Um, Alabama's defense is sub 100. Now they are the number two offense now, not the number one offense on Kim Palm. Um, but how are you feeling about that, you know, looming statistic that you left for us, uh, with the sub sub 100 defense and top five offense, uh, never winning a game in the tournament. Yeah. It is top 10 defense or top 10 offense, bottom hundred or below a hundred, uh, defense. I, and I, I, I think, I think there are, situations where things can be broken obviously before a few years ago 2019 no 16 seed had ever beaten a a one seed right like uh i I think that i think alabama's offense is so prolific that it can it can lead them to a victory versus a a charleston southern or charleston um team um another thing to note for this alabama team is against mid-major opponents alabama has been extremely successful um, all of their losses this season have been to power five opponents. They they haven't, they, I don't think, I think the margin of victory against mid majors is like 18 or 19 points. So um, I, I like our chances. Also, you get two weeks of rest essentially with uh, obviously losing to Florida in the, in the uh, SEC championship or SEC tournament. Yeah. So I, I totally get it. Um, yeah. Like this is, this is a better situation. And as I also talked about on here, even with that looming fact, the schedule that Alabama's played is a lot harder than that Miami team from last year that made it into the final four, who was pretty much the same way with the 99 defense. All right, Christian, is there anything else about this bracket that's really jumping out of you? That's a concerning matchup potentially for the tide. Um, I mean, I think for anyone that's listening, if Alabama gets to the sweet 16, that's a success. Oh, um, it's a good year. I, I, I don't, I, that all I want to do is win the first round game and have an opportunity in the, in the round of 32. Um, so beyond that, like, I'm, I'm just happy. Uh, more, more importantly, I think that uh, something that needs to be kind of talked about is Auburn got screwed on their well, they bracket. Did. They, they did. I mean, they got absolutely screwed and I don't know what kind of logic it was. Cause I tried to look into it and it wasn't like a matchup thing because Al- Auburn hadn't played any of the top three seeds that are in their region and either at Alabama. So um, I, I just, I don't know. And also we're playing them in Spokane. I mean, we were talking to Dom earlier before you got on here and like straight up, we don't know what the committee was thinking this year. Uh, This is a crazy bracket. Like this is madness personified and just putting the teams and seeding some of the teams where they are like Texas A&M should not have been a nine by most bracketologists expectations of much higher seeded team than what they were thinking. And then Florida was close to a six and some people had them as a six and they still ended up as a seven and what's going to be a tough region for them. So I, I don't know what to think with how, where some of these teams are playing, but let's try to pick some games and navigate through this. Let's start with that Alabama's matchup against Charleston uh, guys. What do you like in this matchup? What do you think it might be a little bit rough on the tide? And uh, what do you, how are you feeling? Who's going to win this game? Um, we'll go ahead and start with Maddie. So taking a look at the numbers, um, I like this matchup for Alabama. Uh, you know, we talked about that that sub-100 defense. Taking a look at Charleston, their defense isn't great either. Um, so I think we're going to have a very heavy offensive game here. Um, but I do see Alabama taking taking this one pretty easily. Caleb, who do you got? Yeah, I think you you got to look at Alabama and their experience with, you know, starting off with a, the experienced guard with Sears, and then you got Grant Nelson along with that. I think that just is going to be too much for this Charleston team. I, I could definitely understand this is not the same Charleston team as last year, but Christian, what are your thoughts on this game? I think this is the first matchup in the calendar year 2024 that Alabama is going to go in with a size advantage. Um, That's surprising, isn't it? You know, when you can say yeah. the front court, Yeah. <laughs> We and it's not a big size advantage, but Alabama I think has that type of depth. Um, Charleston Southern starts got uh, guys that are six seven, six nine, six ten. Alabama has a multiple guys that are six nine, six ten. Obviously not the type of physical bruisers that you're you're expecting. Guys, but um, as far as Alabama turned, it's it's a clinic on a. Offense. That's what this game's going to be. If you want to see offense, you want to see threes, you want to see, you know, rim twos and free throws. That's what you're going to get. It's going to be fast paced. It's going to be high scoring, I think. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, with the mid major, I, I like to call us mid major merchants. Um, 
I, I don't I can't pick Alabama against uh, a mid major team or I can't pick a mid major team against Alabama. We are going to see some serious scoring in this game. Um, you know, if Charleston's offense is humming at all, um, this is a team that comes close to averaging three or excuse me, 11 or 10.5 is the is the average, but close to 11 three pointers a game. And then they still allow their opponents to score nearly eight. Um, this team does a decent job of getting to the line, but not great. Um, but they do average around 80 points a game. You're going to be looking at guys like Ryan, uh, Ryan Smith and Ant and uh, Kobe Rogers a little bit around this team trying to make an impact. Um, trying to do anything they can for Charles or for Charleston in this game. But yeah, I'm with you guys. I'm picking Alabama in this one. I feel confident enough. Um, this is not last year's Charleston team. That was so popular as a pick over San Diego state. This team's lost some talent, um, but we'll see what happens with the uh, Cougars. Cause it's, I'm sure enough, it's going to be more frustrating than what we think it's going to be. But uh, I do have Alabama winning this as well. Let's go to the top of the bracket here. Um, I'm imagining that we're all picking North North Carolina. Just give me a thumbs up here. I don't think Howard or Wagner is going to be a team to upset. Yeah. All right. So let's jump to Mississippi State, who was holding on to dear life until the West region. It was kind of getting scary for the Bulldogs. I had the Bulldogs in, and I'm glad I don't have to eat habanero peppers. Um, but do, how do we feel about this Michigan State game uh, with them and facing uh, Tom, them fe- facing Izzo? Uh, Chris, do you want to start us off with this? Cause you're just grinning too much about that habanero comment. I thought you were going to have to eat the habanero and I was going to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I had them in. Uh, I knew they were in. <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, MSU is going to win. Okay. Yeah. I, I do like state quite a bit. Caleb, your thoughts. Yeah, this is a tough one where, like you said, with these teams getting in Mississippi state, hanging on for dear life, you know, I think Michigan state getting in with, you know, the Izzo factor of I think that has to attribute to part of it. But I'm going to go Michigan State in this one. I like Tyson Walker for Michigan State. And, you know, it's one of those things where Izzo is pretty good in March. So we'll see what happens with a Mississippi State team that was close to not getting in, but they managed to get in and we'll see what happens. All right, Maddie, who do you got? Do you like Miss? Do you like Sparty or do you like State? I'm going to go with State in this one um, just because Michigan State, I feel like, has been pretty unreliable throughout the season. So uh, when it comes down to big time, I feel more confident in picking Mississippi State. Christian, I just realized something. You said that you liked MSU, and you were going to let me slide past that. Who's your pick, Christian? <laughs> I was waiting for someone to pick that up. <laughs> I was just going to let it roll. I was going to be nice to you, Christian. Uh, no, I did it intentionally. I was, I was hoping that David picked it up, but he didn't. Um, no, I got State winning this one. Um, I, I think <laughs> Who do you have? <laughs> I, I have Mississippi State winning this one. I think Josh Hubbard is a is an electric talent. I think Tolu Smith um is gonna present a lot of problems in the front court. And um I think I I think we're gonna continue on the bracket talk, right? So there's there's some stuff I have down the road for for Mississippi State. So yeah, stay tuned. I, I think I think that's an entertaining matchup and a good notion. I'm glad that I caught what you said. Otherwise, I'd be over here like, wait a minute, who did Christian pick? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm with you guys. I got Mississippi State winning this one. Michigan State's a team that only wins the boards by about two boards a night. Um, having Tolu Smith in this front court that Mississippi State has. Uh, presents a lot of problems and this is a great defensive team too so i'm gonna rock the bulldogs here um which tells me that i need to pick some nines in the other brackets for sure um based on how uh trends normally go so this is my second eight pick so i'm gonna go mississippi state so we're gonna have north carolina and mississippi state in the next one let's go south and let's talk about the matchup that's really intriguing here grand canyon is facing saint mary's who do you guys like in this one maddie Give me the antelopes. I think this is going to be one of those upsets um, that that everyone's going to be rooting for. It's going to be very St. Peter's esque, I think, for the for Grand Canyon this season. Caleb, who do you like in this one? Yeah, same here. Give me the lopes in this one. They've lost four games all season coming in, and you know we talked about it with Dom a little bit. St. Mary's is a team that has really struggled this year. You know they kind of quote unquote righted the ship in the WCC, but other than that, you know. I, th- I think Grand Canyon comes in with a strong team, and I think they're going to carry some momentum and you know get the upset here in this five twelve matchup. This is interesting because we picked McNeese State on the other side. Uh, Kayla or Christian, who you got? Uh, well, I I was going to pick Grand Canyon, but if you both are picking Grand Canyon, I don't want to pick Grand Canyon, so I'll I'll pick I'll pick St. Mary's. 
All right. It's an interesting take. Um, yeah, I really like Grand Canyon also. That's the team I just like. They've been face power six competition. Uh, I know this is going to be a popular one, but I, I remind people that the Resource Nexus had this as the number one mid-major team in the country coming into the season. And then Tyson Grant's a guy who puts up 20 points a game. Um, you know, they face good competition. They uh they came in second in the Arizona Temp off MTE uh facing South Carolina. There's a lot of good players on this team, and Grand Canyon was a team that came in with a lot of expectation for this season. So I'm going to I'm going to pick Grand Canyon and I'm going to advance them in this one. Sorry, Christian, you don't get St. Mary's against Alabama to talk about when we go back through. All right, let's talk about the three, uh, the three seed here. And that is going to be Baylor facing Colgate in this one. Guys, who do you like? I'm going to go Baylor here. Um, while I feel like Colgate is one of the stronger mid-majors, I just think Baylor's going to be a little too much for him. Christian, I'll go to you. Give me toothpaste. Give you toothpaste. Let's go toothpaste. All right, you're going with the Red Raiders in this one. It's it's not a bad pick. They're a fun team. Caleb, who do you got? Yeah, kind of on the same consensus with Maddie. Give me the Baylor Bears in this one. I think, you know, Colgate, fantastic job for you making the tournament, being one of those tough mid-major teams. But when it comes to uh, tournament time, give me Baylor in the Big 12. So I don't like Baylor's defense, honestly. Um, and that's that's something. And Colgate is a team that likes to run a little bit. This is a recipe for some entertainment. So I'm actually jumping aboard with Christian here and I'm going with toothpaste, baby. Uh, give me Colgate. Um, this one's going to be fun. Um, but so that means, Caleb, you are our tiebreaker. So which direction are you leaning here? But like, I, again, I need some chaos in this. And uh, to me, to me, toothpaste is the right one. I mean, if that's the case, you know, let's get minty fresh here and go with toothpaste. Let's go. Let's go Colgate. Uh, let's go ahead and advance Colgate over Baylor on that one. It makes for a more interesting conversation anyway. Clemson taking on New Mexico. New Mexico is really hot. They just won the Mountain West tournament. And of course, this is Patino's son uh, in this one. I liked Clemson at one point, but I moved them down recently from my teams to pick throughout this thing, especially after that Boston College loss in the ACC tournament. Guys. Who do you like in this one? Do you like PJ Hall and Clemson or do we like New Mexico? This is one I think I could honestly pull out a coin here. Um, you know, Clemson's kind of slipped off the radar a little bit for me. Um, like I said, New Mexico's hot. So I'm going to go with the hot team. Let's go to Mexico. Okay. Caleb, who do you got? Yeah. It's a tough matchup, you know. Like you said, Tennessee or Clemson has fallen off a little bit. You know, struggling in that ACC tournament. That you know, with Hall, you look at what he's done this season. But kind of following suit with Maddie, you got Patino's son here with New Mexico, the hot team going in. Just won the the conference tournament. So give me New Mexico State in this one, or New Mexico. Who do you like? Um, I'm not gonna fight. <laughs> I'm not going to pick against the Patino in March, so let me get a uh, New Mexico and I, and especially with uh, Rick Patino, it's not going to, since they're not going to be in the uh, NIT, you could see uh, Rick going over and helping his son a little bit with some uh, bracket help. Well, we'll see what happens there. That would be a, that'd be a little bit of interesting uh, situation there. Um, I'm going to go Clemson here um, and I'm just going to pick against the grain here. I do like Clemson's defense. It is sub 100 on the rating and it's not half bad. And then they also hit eight, three pointers in the game. Uh, this is a team that's a little bit of effect. Yeah, it's it's somewhat effective. And also, as we know, that conference tournament champions sometimes don't particularly do well uh, coming in that first round. So I'm going to rock Clemson, who's a little bit more rested and probably a little bit angry after losing to Boston College. But that means we're advancing New Mexico based on those picks. All right, let's go Dayton Flyers versus New Me or versus the Nevada Wolfpack. Who do you guys like in that one? Uh, Christian, we'll start with you this time. Uh, I mean, I like Dayton, obviously, is coached by former Alabama co head coach uh, Anthony Grant. Um, they've been pretty consistent over the last couple of years. I don't think they made the tournament last year, but I think Nevada is going to give them a real run for their money. And I think actually Nevada is favored in this game. So I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with Nevada. Maddie, who do you like? I like Nevada in this one. Dayton, um, another team that's kind of been uh, a little uh regress throughout the season so give me nevada caleb yeah i think i'm going with not nevada in this one dayton's one of those teams that you know they seem to be very inconsistent all season and that's one of the things that when it comes to march consistency is going to be big in this one and you know i like nevada in this one that you know that their guard lucas coming in to averaging 17.8 a game 
And that, that's going to be big, shooting 89% from the line. It, it's going to be a big piece for them as they look to advance over the, the Dayton Flyers. I'm with you guys. I'm going Nevada in this one as well. But I will note that if Deron Holmes has a big game for Dayton, uh, that's a team that's hard to stop when they have all their pieces. Same with Nate Santos when he gets going. He's the, he was a big reason that Dayton team earlier this season did so well in Charleston. So this is, to me, can be a very, very close and interesting matchup. But uh, I'm going to go to the group here and I'm going to go Nevada in this. All right. So the last one on the bottom, we got Arizona taking on Long Beach State. Anybody got the beach in this one or would we all like Arizona? It's a great story, but I got Arizona. Yeah, let's say I've got Arizona. They're a little they they look too good, and I don't think they're losing the two fifteen seeds in a row. Um, so I'm gonna rock that. I'm gonna rock the Wildcats. You guys, yep. Maddie, Ar- Arizona's my pick on this one as well. Okay, so we got Arizona advancing to face new or to face Nevada. All right, so North Carolina versus Mississippi State, and then we'll jump to the Alabama game. Uh, who do we like in the new North Carolina Mississippi State? Christian, you're nodding your head. I like this. All right. I wonder if you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Go ahead. I got state. I got Mississippi State in the Sweet 16. It's um, it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I, I I like I said, I love Josh Hubbard. Um, and I think he's one of those guys that can get hot and pull a team to win. Um, I think with Tolu Smith, that matches up perfectly with uh Baycott. And the R.J. Davis, Josh Hubbard uh, round of 32 game would be absolutely electric. But I, I, I'm i I'm riding with the Bulldogs. I got Mississippi State. I'm with you. I understand that. I'm with I'm with Caleb or I'm with Christian on this one. I am going Mississippi State. That defense has shown that it can take down some offenses this year. And as much as North Carolina gets out, gets out and run, I'm going to go state in this. And yeah, I like the Bulldogs. And as I mentioned, one player can drag you through pretty far in a tournament. And Josh Hubbard is a big piece of that offense. Give me the Bulldogs. What are you two thinking? Give me experience in March. I'm going to go with North Carolina in this one. RJ Davis is a good pick. Mondo Baycott. Understand. Understand. All right, Caleb. I was about to say, Maddie read my mind on this one. I, I got to love the experience between Armando Baycott and R.J. Davis. You know, they this North Carolina team has a bad taste in their mouth after last year, how last year went. They're, they're on a mission this year. Had a rocky start at the beginning of the season a little bit, but they've really bounced back, and I think they're going to get past Mississippi State in this one. All right, Caleb, you're the tiebreaker, so tell us who we're putting in the Sweet 16. We're going to advance North Carolina. Ah, of course we are. I, if we turn out right, if me and Christian turn out right on this one, like there's gonna be there's gonna be some kind of bet that goes down on this. Like Christian, you got you to want? eat a habanero. Oh, ooh, ooh, the are, habanero. Christian. Do you want to see me cry? Like I don't. I'm not ready for that. Then then pick Mississippi State. <laughs> Is that simple? I'm not the tiebreaker. You don't have to bring it up with me. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna get more advanced North Carolina. We'll come off the bet off screen on this. All right. So now we've got. Alabama taking on Grand Canyon. Christian, I know that you have talked about liking this matchup in this draw for Alabama. So what do you like with uh, Alabama facing Grand Canyon? Look, and I, I said it before, Alabama is a difficult team to prepare for on a day's uh, day of notice. Um, the, the, the system, the offensive system that they run um, can prevent or can produce a lot of tough looks for um, teams. and. I I think that if Alabama wins the first round game, they get to the Sweet 16 just because of that fact on its own. So give me Alabama in this one, obviously. Okay, guys. Um, Maddie, who do you like? Christian, don't hate me. I'm going to go with the Lopes. Okay, why are you going with the Lopes? Like, <laughs> let's, let's try to figure this out. I mean, just taking a look at Alabama this season, um, obviously very hot offensively. Um, they don't tend to shoot as well on on a neutral court, and Grand Canyon's got a pretty decent defense. I mean, I do agree that the Lopes do have a pretty decent defense. Caleb, who do you got in this one? Yeah, as much as I, I love the story of Grand Canyon coming in this one, I'm going to go with Alabama just because, you know, I go back to the combination of what they've got with Grant Nelson, Marcus Sears. You got to love – that combination, but also just overall their strength of schedule, what the gauntlet they went through. I think they just have the experience that they're going to uh, move forward and take care of Grand Canyon. 
I am going to take Alabama's offense for this. I do agree with Christian. That's going to be a tough one to deal with. Uh, so I'm I'm going to rock Alabama in this, and that'll be the way I think we're advancing this one. Correct? That's three one Alabama on that. Yeah, good deal. Colgate versus New Mexico is an interesting matchup that we have created in this uh, mess. Uh, so. We going with the Patino or are we going with the toothpaste? That is the question in this one. Uh, Maddie, who do you like in this one? I'll start off with you. You know, in this one, this weird matchup that we have created for ourselves here. Um, thanks a lot, David and Christian. Um, You're welcome. I, I mean, give me, give me, give me the toothpaste. Let's go, Colgate. <laughs> That is a heck of a run by Colgate making it to the Sweet 16, Maddie. All right, Caleb, who do you got? New Mexico or do you got Colgate? Give me the patino on this one. I, I think, you know, like we've said, typically teams coming off a conference championship doesn't do too well. But I, I think New Mexico is just going to be too much for Colgate and the toothpaste. All right, Christian, who do you got? Unfortunately, this is where the toothpaste run ends, and I got a I got a patino in this one. Yeah, I'm gonna go patino, and I'm gonna say toothpaste is at the end of the tube. Uh, and yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and advance New Mexico. Uh, Jalen House, I think, would also be too much, and then JT Top is a pretty darn good rebounder uh, for New Mexico as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm with you guys. Let's go New Mexico and advance them to the Sweet 16. And then we got Nevada versus Arizona. Uh, for a chance to go to the Sweet 16, who do we like in this one? Um, we'll start with Caleb at this time. Yeah, I think when you get here, you're looking at it. Um, I think Arizona is just going to be too much for the Wolfpack, and I think they're going to advance on into the next round versus New Mexico. Christian, who do you like? I got Nevada just because of vibes. Just off vibes. Okay, mm -hmm. I feel it. Just off vibes. All right, Maddie, who do you like in this I one? I like the vibes, Christian, but I'm going to go with the Wildcats. I mean, Arizona's checking a lot of the March boxes and Caleb Love can score. So while I appreciate Christian's vibes in this one, uh, I'm going to go take I'm going to take Arizona. Don't get me wrong. I totally think something stupid can always happen in March. But uh, the logic here tells me to take Arizona in this one. All right, let's go back around the horn here. So we have Alabama versus North Carolina in the Sweet 16 uh, in this game. All right. Christian, this is your team. So tell us what you thought, what you think here. Are you going to go North Carolina or are you going to go Alabama and why? Well, so I was going to have Mississippi State in here and then Alabama was going to beat them for the third time to get to the Elite Eight. This was the entire plan. Obviously, you guys didn't agree with the plan, but um, I have North Carolina. If it Alabama versus North Carolina, I think um, Baycott is just going to dominate if, if they get matched up against each other and um, which I'll say this, if Alabama gets to the sweet 16, like I said previously, that's a successful season. Um, so I'm ha more than happy to lose to, to North Carolina. Um, and so I have North Carolina in this one. Maddie, who do you got? Uh, give me the Tar Heels. You know, I think they have a great team. Like you said, checking a lot of boxes for me. So, um, give me North Carolina. Caleb, do you like the Tar Heels or do you like the Tide? As about to say, I'm going to follow suit here and give me the Tar Heels. Yeah, uh, I'm with everybody in this. Marno Baycott's a problem uh, for this Alabama team. When you facing a dominant big, it's just not been something we've seen Alabama do well. Um, note, Janai Broom, P.J. Hall, um, Tobu Smith was, I think they beat Mississippi State. Yeah, you mentioned it too, L, but like still, a lot of the bigs have caused problems for Alabama through the course of the season. So I, I'm going to go with Marno Baycott to be the key player that pushes North Carolina. I think these two offenses could push a lot of points up together collectively, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and advance North Carolina to our elite eight. All right, guys, out of the bottom of the bracket, we ended up with New Mexico versus Arizona, Arizona, keeping it very regional in our bracket so far. Um, but let's see who we have here for between these two. Who do you like? Um, let's start with Maddie. Uh, give me the cats in this one. Uh, like we keep saying, those tournament teams that uh, end up winning their conference don't tend to go too far um, when it comes to the NCAA. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take the Wildcats in this one. Christian, who do you got? Man, I'm not gonna go chalk. So I can't have one and two on this side of the bracket. So hey, give me New Mexico. Two, yeah. Uh, so New Mexico is interesting. I totally get where you're coming from, though. Like that's not normally how March goes. 
Um, but Arizona is one of those teams that I've circled a lot for this season uh, to go potentially deep. But I think their train gets off at some point. Um, I'm going to go Arizona here. I, I, I'm going to go Arizona. It just takes two. If this is the matchup, uh, I like I like Arizona in this one. Caleb? Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I think New Mexico cannot make it past the Cats in this one. I think they're going to advance. Unfortunately, we will have that one-two matchup. But I, I think realistic here, when you look at these two teams and the matchups, like David said, you've got to been, have been circling Arizona all year long, for, and they've checked those boxes. So Arizona, I'm going to have advancing in this one. Yeah, I, I get where the chalk feeling comes from because, like, it, this is this seems a little too chalk on this one. This is probably our least chaotic bracket so far, other than Colgate, um, <laughs> than the uh, Colgate situation that we've created. But let's go ahead and let's pick a winner of this bracket. Do we like North Carolina or Arizona to make the final four? Um, Maddie, we'll go ahead and we'll do it. We'll do. I'll go around the horn as it seems to me, but we'll go with you first, Maddie. Man, on this one, it it it's a it's a hard pick for me, um. But I'm gonna do uh, my good friends over in North Carolina a favor and pick the Tar Heels. Okay, Caleb, who do you got? Me and the Tar Heels in this one. See, okay, so my pick out of this region anyway was Arizona, so I'm picking Arizona here. Um. I, they've got the shooting. They've got the offense to run with North Carolina. Um, I think Ballo versus uh, I think Ballo versus Baycott's going to be an interesting matchup down low in this game. But North Carolina should shoot their free throws a little bit better, but they don't have the three point shooting that national champions typically have. Uh, so I'm going to take Arizona to advance to the Final Four. Caleb, who do you got? Ben Christian. I'm sorry, I keep doing it. There's too many. You guys are right next to me, each other on the screen. Christian, who do you got? So before I make my pick, who are the rest of your final four? So right now, my final four, I've got, well, the picked final four. Yeah, the picked final four. The picked final four so far is we got Tennessee uh, in the final four. I had Purdue. It was my pick, but like the group consensus ended up being Tennessee. I was outvoted there. So Christian, who are you going with? Well, first of all, trusting Rick Barnes in March is certainly a choice. It is um, a choice. I'm going to go Arizona just because I don't like chalk. All right. So, Caleb, break or tie. Do we have two two seeds in the tournament or in the final four so far? Or do we have a one and a two seed? Let's go with two two seeds. Okay. This will be fun. I, I like Arizona. They were pretty darn close to a one seed this, this time around. Christian, why don't you tell everybody about Crimson Crossover and all the fun stuff you guys are doing for March? Yeah, so Crimson Crossovers, Alabama basketball podcast that we have going on. Um, we've been doing it for about five years. Um, as far as what we have going on, we have Evan Maya coming on tomorrow on the podcast. So um, I guess if you release this tomorrow, it would be today. Evan Maya like midnight tonight or something like okay. that. Okay. Yes. Well, Evan Maya is coming on on Tuesday is when the, when the podcast is being released. So we're doing that. Um, additionally, we do post game spaces following uh, the game. So we'll have those um, as well. And then depending on how far Alabama goes, obviously that's kind of our schedule. It kind of just dictates on whether or not we win or lose. So that's what we got going on. Yeah, it'll be a good one. Guys, please go follow Crimson Crossover. You go find them at Crimson X over on Twitter. And they've got an excellent podcast. I've been listening to it. Uh, hopefully Sam stays out of the house for the entire portion of March for you, uh, Christian. I hope that works out. Or well, so. fun fact for everyone listening. My wife, Sam, anytime she leaves the house, Alabama, it comes back and wins. There's been like four or five instances where Alabama has been down 12, 15 points. She's left the house and they immediately went on a run and won. Last week, she didn't leave. We lost to Florida. This weekend, she might be going to Disney World. So if you have Alabama in your bracket, you might want to pick them to, to get to the Sweet 16 because she won't be here. So. It'll, it'll be a fun one if that's how it's going to work out for you, Christian. Best of luck in the first weekend with that. So go ahead, guys. Go ahead and follow Crimson Crossover. Uh, it's, a, it's a great follow. Christian, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. And the home of the number one overall seed in this one. UConn is the number one seed in this tournament here in the East region. They're going to be taking on Stetson. Stetson's first appearance all time in the NCAA tournament. Guys, who do you like in this matchup? As much as I would love the chaos that ensued for someone named the Hatters with the cowboy hat logo to make it deep in the tournament, um, just because I know that the commentators and everybody watching would bust out their cowboy hats, I got to go UConn here. Like you said, David, 
they're a team that has a possibility to hit that back-to-back championships in the first time in 2007. So they're making it deep. Got to get past the first round to do that. I'm going with the Huskies. Caleb, who do you like? Yeah, I got to follow suit there. It's one of those things where you look at the quality of this team and what they've done all season. You know, it's unfortunate for Stetson that their first time ever making the tournament, they have to go up against the number one overall seed. But, hey, at least they say they can made it and most likely play the eventual champions. Yeah, I mean, Stetson's not a bad team. I mean, they were the Sunshine Slam champions. They were the Ace Sun Tournament champions. They got a good win against UCF this season. Their offense is ranks in the top 100 in the country. But, yeah, there's absolutely no way they're keeping up with the juggernaut with the offense that UConn plays with. This seems like a pretty easy slam here. Um, to me, you shut down Blackman on this Stetson team, UConn advances no problem here. All right, let's go on to a more interesting matchup. Uh, we got Florida Atlantic taking on Northwestern. Maddie, who's your pick and why on this one? You know, you're you're teeing it up pretty hard here, David. These these two teams are – it's going to be an interesting matchup for sure. Um, it's one of those I think I, I could pull a coin out of my pocket and go either way. Um, but I feel more confident in the way Northwestern has played um, over the last – couple of weeks um other uh, outside of florida atlantic so let's go northwestern in this one caleb who do you like yeah i'm gonna go opposite matter here in fau in this one i love the experience they're bringing back majority of their team that, that made that run last year so i think they have a good shot to get by northwestern in this first round okay so we have picked now if the between this vote you're gonna end up picking three number eights which is not normally what happens at the ncaa tournament um, so yeah, okay. I understand where you guys are coming from. FAU is a very good team with a great coach and a lot of experience. And I'm right there with you guys. Uh, give me FAU in this one. They lost a tough one in uh, the American conference tournament, but, uh, Janelle Davis is hard to stop 18 points a game. And then you got Elijah Martin, who's also out there getting two threes a game. Uh, I'm with you. Give me Dusty May and give me the Florida Atlantic Owls to advance in this one to face UConn in the next round. All right, so let's jump to San Diego State taking on UAB. San Diego State, of course, the team that came out and were the runners up last year. I, I like I like San Diego State a lot. This is a very quality team to me. You know, one thing that I love about the Aztecs is they have a coach whose basketball history, if you're into basketball history, you have to adore Brian Dutcher, um, the assistant coach for the Fab Five at Michigan under Scott Fisher. Uh, Dutcher continues to bring great basketball to Southern California and puts his team in a position to be at the top of the Mountain West year after year. They get some really good wins against St. Mary's, Gonzaga, New Mexico, um, but ended up losing New Mexico in that conference tournament, and they finished fifth in the Mountain West this year. You know, guys, this is a tough one, but who do you like in this one uh, between these two? As much as I like UAB, um, you know, we've picked a lot of 12 over 5 upsets, so I'm going to have to go San Diego State on this one. Uh, David, you made some good points for them. I like their coach. I like this team, and they've they've had a hard hard battle throughout the year, so I think that experience is going to carry them through to the, the second round. Caleb, are yeah. we going to – are you going to continue the all these 12s over the 5s right now, and you're going to pick UAB? Unfortunately, not this time. I love that Cinderella, the 12-5 the matchup. That's one of the favorite ones I like to watch. But in this one, I don't think UAB has what it takes to get by San Diego State, and San Diego State's going to move on to the next round. Uh, one of the things I agree and I like about this is they got some unfinished business for San Diego State. San Diego's defense, uh, by the way, you know, ranks in the top 10 in Kim Palm and adjusted defense, and it was one of the best defensive ratings in the Mountain West this season. Uh, and then uh, Jaden Le Leedy is the guy that, you know, you're just going to have to lock him down. That's going to be difficult for any opponent to deal with. Uh, so for me, this is some unfinished business. You got some guys returning on this team who were on last year's team that ended up losing to UConn. Here they are in the same bracket with them. I think San Diego State's got a little chip on their shoulder to get out of this thing. Give me San Diego State uh, to advance in this one. I'm taking the five here and in this matchup. All right, so that brings us to Auburn versus Yale. Yale wins on a buzzer beater in the Ivy League tournament. A lot of drama in that one. Um, but this is a good Auburn team. They've proven themselves that they are much better than metrics darlings, which is what they were starting to shape out to be. You know, I, I was talking about like Auburn needing to beat somebody. Well, they did that in the SEC tournament. Um, 
Also, the fact that we were talking about the SEC tournament and how conference champions are normally two and a half times uh, unlikely, more unlikely than their counterparts to make it to far in March. Auburn was the last team to make the Final Four who won the SEC tournament. Uh, so let's talk about this a little bit. It's a fun matchup, but I think most of us are thinking Auburn is going to end up winning this bracket, branding this round. What do you guys think? Yeah, give me yeah. the Tigers in this one. Um, they've they've been pretty dominant as of late. Like you said, two Q1 wins lately, so helping their resume quite a bit. And they've been they've been tested, so they're ready. Caleb, what do you think? Yeah, I think I, I agree with Maddie there. You got to look at Janai Broom leading the way for this team. You know, he's the leader on this team, came back for another year after last year, and I think they get things done against Yale. Unfortunately, we'll get to it in a little bit, but they did not have the best draw on this side of the bracket, but they make it through this first round against Yale. This is a really crummy draw for Auburn, um, but yeah, one thing that I noticed is that Yale does not exactly rebound the basketball well. Um, to me, like this is an opportunity for Cardwell and Janai Broom to take full advantage here. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm expecting Auburn to advance in this one. Um, of course, the Tigers finished second in the SEC. Really great team on paper. This is a team to easily to fall in love with. They're in the top five of the BPI. They got some great metrics behind them. Um, but yeah, you're right, Caleb. This is not an ideal draw for Auburn, and it's it's kind of rough. But we'll see how it shapes out on this one. All right, guys. The next game we're looking at on this bracket: BYU versus Duquesne. Uh, what are you guys looking on this one? Because there's a one player that I am really circling on that BYU squad. Um, but what are your thoughts on this matchup? Go ahead, Caleb. I'll let you take this one. Yeah, I think this is an interesting matchup. You look at BYU. The guy that I'm looking at on this team, Jackson Robinson. Yeah. <laughs> former Razorback, as you can tell. Big Razorback fan here. A guy that you know played for Arkansas for a year. Well, was on the team for a year. Didn't get a ton of minutes left, and now you see him flourishing here, leading BYU in scoring, and they're going up against a strong to gain team that is coached by Keith Dambra, if you know that name, Coach LeBron James. So I have nonetheless that this will be an exciting matchup, but I think BYU gets the win here. I really like BYU. BYU is a team I like and probably one of the best groups of fan bases that you'll ever deal with uh, in your life. BYU fans are outstanding. But if you like crazy fun basketball, then come party with BYU. Um, yeah, you just already mentioned Jackson Robinson. He's a great player. Um, here's the thing about BYU. Everybody shoots the ball. Big guys at the four and five like Waterman and, you know, they'll get out there and they'll still hit one three pointer a game and they'll shoot it in transition. Too. Like this, this team's crazy in the way they play. Um, you know, they've they've got a lot of interesting ways to play. They they move the ball well. They their spacing is outstanding. They're also extremely efficient from two because of how well they shoot the three, because teams become concerned about that three. And defenders will actually jump out sometimes to try to guard the three pass instead of defending an easy two-point layup because they're afraid of the kick out. They've got assist on 60% of their baskets. I really like BYU. They utilize a lot of zoom action like Purdue does as well. Uh, and one of the things they'll do that's different, though, is that they'll reject dribble handoffs. This team is like watching a video game play basketball, and they're a lot of fun to watch. Um, yeah, I, I like BYU. There's a reason I have them as one of my bronze tier picks. They can cause some chaos in this thing. So I'm going BYU. Matty. Six guys that shoot over 35% from three-pointer. They're bombing. They're bombing. <laughs> I'm going BYU as well. Obviously, a little underseeded due to um, some circumstances. So, BYU, a little bit better than they should be against uh, Duquesne. So, I, I'm going to go with them as well. Illinois is our number three seed, and they're taking it on Moorhead State, the Ohio Valley Conference winners. Guys, what do you like about this matchup, and what are you thinking here? Yeah, I'll kick things off here. You know, I really like Illinois. Terrence Shannon Jr. has been on a tear here recently. He just put up 40 points in that that game uh, in the semifinals for the conference tournament. And I think he's just getting warmed up as we get ready to take on the NCAA tournament. And I, I think it's unfortunate for Moorhead State that they have to go up against this Illinois team right now. Yeah, this is going to be a tough matchup. Matt, Maddie, what are you thinking of this one? Yeah, Caleb kind of took the words right out of my mouth. Unfortunately for Moorhead State, they are a good basketball program, um, but Illinois is too hot right now. Um, Taryn Shannon Jr., somebody we talked about all season long, um, had a little bit of trouble earlier in the year, but stuck around. So um, I think he's going to be leading the way for a, a decent run um, for Illinois. 
So I've got Moorhead State circled as one of my potential bracket busters, um, you know, and also talking to Isaac, he liked this team too. Um, to me, personal opinion, the Ohio Valley was deeper than some people were giving it credit for in the preseason. It, it's never going to be a multi-bid league, but this conference had three champions. They had Moorhead State, Little Rock, and T Tennessee Martin. Um, you know, OVC had four teams who won 20 games out of this league. Um, the champs, you know, and Western Illinois. Um, Moorhead is better than you think and given the right opportunities, I, I think they can bust some brackets and Illinois seems like a really good chance to me. Uh, it's a regional match. It's a regional matchup. This is an interesting team. You got guys like Minix who can put up 20 points and is averaging a double double a game. This is a great defensive team. I'm going to pick Moorhead uh, in this matchup for an upset, um, but we're going to advance Illinois because that's the way that you two are landing in this one. But I, I do like Moorhead a lot. Washington State takes on Drake. This is another Met team. Drake's another team that I like, but Washington State's really intriguing. How are you guys feeling about this one, Maddie? We'll start with you. This one, as you like to say, the, the bracket-busting team. I'm going to go with Drake here. Um, no, usually the 7-10 the seed line isn't really one that breaks a lot of brackets, but I think Drake is capable enough to get through this game um, and take down Washington State. Caleb, what are you thinking here? Do you like the Bulldogs or do you like the Cougars? Let's let the madness ensue. Give me the Drake Bulldogs. You know, you got to like what DeVries is doing, averaging 21.8 points per game. And I think this is going to be an interesting game. Like Maddie said, this isn't where you typically see those bracket busting. But I think Drake's going to be a really good team that comes in here and knocks off number seven Washington State. Yeah, I know the entire MVC is going to be behind break, Drake because they took that Indiana State spot there. Um, but like my favorite thing I've heard about Washington State this season, my favorite line about this team is that they're great and it doesn't make any dang sense. Um, yeah, that's the crazy thing about Washington. The numbers are strange. Go take a look at them. Um, they they should not be this good. Team uh, runs just a weird way of playing. This is like the West Coast version of South Carolina. They were picked tenth, picked to finish tenth in the Pac-12, and they end up near the top of the conference. Uh, no high level recruits on this team. Might be one of the most unique rosters you've ever seen put together. Uh, they have guys on this team that didn't play D1 ball before they transferred. Um, and then you have one of the best stories in college basketball, 6'3", Miles Rice, who was a three-star coming out of high school, who went to Washington State, was only, was his only, Washington State was his only high major offer. He ended up committing in 2020. Um, this is his first year playing college basketball because he just got done battling cancer. He is a star. Uh, came high of 35 points, averages over 15 points at night for the Cougars, and he facilitates the ball well. He's a shifty driver, can evade defenders, uh, finishes well in the paint. He's a true general, and uh, he's got a huge burst of speed that allows him to get past defenders. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Washington State's weird, and they don't make a lot of sense when you, when you break it down, but they've got a style that allows them to beat good competition. Um, and it, it really, they, they don't have any solid defenders but the entire team defends well and it's tough to play against that so i'm taking washington state i like drake drake's a really good team but I, i'm gonna take washington state and go against the grain here again in this bracket with you guys but we're gonna go ahead and advance drake all right iowa state versus south dakota state this is my biggest hope for a 15 over a two but this is a really tough year to get that i'm not sure if that trend's going to continue what do you guys think here yeah i think with this iowa state team uh like you said with that trend um it, I don't think it's going to happen here. While South Dakota State definitely a solid team, I feel like Iowa State had a possibility to to move forward um, if they had a couple more games to play before the tournament selection. Um, so I'm I'm going to go with Iowa State on this one. Yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think Iowa State in this one. You know, you love those 15-2 matchups, like you said, and this one was one that you could be could have circled, but I think. Iowa State's going to just come in here and be too strong for South Dakota and the Jacks in this one, so I think they're going to move on. Iowa State finished second in the Big 12, won the Big 12 tournament, and they have done. They finished fourth in the ESPN Invitational uh, earlier in their MTE. They've got wins over Houston, Kansas, Texas, BYU. This is not a high volume offense, but is one that you know it has the ability to play. They surprisingly, this is an up tempo team for their style of play and how poor their offense is. This team only puts up 1.29 points per shot. Um, and 1.14 per possession. This is a low three-point volume shooting team at 6.6, .6, uh, which is not something we're seeing. That's normally on 18.4 attempts. It's not something I'm really excited about for an offensive team. Um, you know, Gilbert, Lipsy, uh, Jones are key scorers for this team. Um, you know, they got a crushing defense, though. 
That's the thing with Iowa State. The defense is crushing. It falls right behind Houston as the second best defense in the Big 12. Fifth most steals in the country per game. Leads the Big 12 uh, for steals and the power six at the power six level. Um, Lipsy's got fantastic hands and knows how to turn you over at 2.8 steals per game and 3.7 per 40 minutes. I mean, this is a high IQ basketball team that likes to stick themselves in their passing lanes before something even develops. Uh, so to me, I'm going to go Iowa State here as much as I want South Dakota State to finally get a win in the NCAA tournament with all the great teams that they put together. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to go Iowa State here. This is a tough matchup. Uh, so that's going to advance for me. Let's go back to the top here. We got UConn taking on FAU was the pick. Who do you like in this matchup, guys, to make the Sweet 16? Give me UConn here. Um, even though FAU made that great run last season, I think UConn's just not unbeatable, but as close to it as we're going to get. Caleb, who do you got? Do you like UConn or do you like the Owls? Yeah, give me the Huskies in this one. I, I think it's just one of those things, like I said before, UConn is one of the most complete teams this year that they look like they have the opportunity to go back to back championships. And I think they easily move past UConn here. I'm also going to go. FAU. Yeah, I get you. I, I'm going to go UConn here as well. Let's jump to San Diego State versus Auburn here. This one's, like I said, this is a tough draw for Auburn. They should be a sweet, they're a sweet 16 caliber team, but they're not facing a team you necessarily want to face uh, in your second round game for a four versus five matchup. What are you guys thinking here in this one between War Eagle and uh, the Aztecs? Yeah, like you said before at the, you know, when we were talking about that first round matchup, I think San Diego State's got a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. And I think, you know, like we said on how unfortunate of a draw it is for Auburn, I think San Diego State uses that motivation and gets back to a matchup with UConn. Maddie, what are you thinking here on this one? I'm going to go San Diego State on this one, uh, mainly because, you know, just the way that Auburn plays, I feel like this is going to be a heavy game at the free throw line. And I feel like San Diego State is going to get a lot of opportunities for some free points there. The defense on San Diego State is really dang good. Um, where I'm concerned is the boards and the three-point shooting. Now, Auburn can be inconsistent at times from shooting from deep, um, and but the Aztecs do allow more three-pointers than they make three-pointers in a game. But one thing they don't do is they don't foul. They're under 16 fouls per game. They don't normally put teams easily in the bonus. Uh, for me, this is a coin flip game. And depending on how Auburn does here um, will depend on how far they go. They're either getting to the Sweet 16 or they're going to get eliminated in the round of 32. I think that's really what it's coming down to here. I'm going to go Auburn and pick against you guys just because I don't think this can be a unanimous game. Um, but obviously we're going to be moving San Diego State on. But like Auburn's done enough to me to convince me that they're a good team that can play with anyone. I think a UConn Auburn game would be very entertaining because there are some questions I have for both these teams statistic wise. But um, obviously we're moving south or San Diego State on. But I, I, Auburn can win this game, but this is going to be a tough opponent. And this is the worst ass they could possibly get uh, for their bracket. All right, let's move down the bracket. We got BYU versus Illinois. Guys, this one's fun. I like this game, if this is the game. But who do you guys think in here? Caleb, I'll start with you. I'm going to go with BYU in this one. I, I I really like what they're bringing to the table with that ability to shoot, like we said before, those six players shooting over 35% from deep. Like you said, the big man even shooting it from deep. I think this Illinois team is going to find it tough to contend with how well BYU is shooting the ball. Matty, who do you got? I'm going to go BYU as well, uh, mainly just because fighting Illini, Illini, however you say that one. Um, Terrence Shane Jr., if they cover him up, it, it's going to be hard for them to get through that game. It's certainly, you're going to see a lot of offense if this is the game. Uh, the offense is one of the, Illinois' offense is one of the most potent uh, in basketball, and it's it's top 15 in the country uh, and per game. Uh, putting points up uh, the Illini average beating opponents by double digits a night. They're used to beating teams. Uh, the rebounding is good. The defense can raise alarming levels of bad at times. Uh, it's something that they've worked on, but Underwood has even called this team out on its defense being soft. And I worry with a team that can shoot everything that could be a problem. These are two teams that I, I you know, I, I had like picked as like my bronze tier team. So I, I said one of them's gonna, you know, not make it like out of that those 18 teams that I picked out earlier. 
uh, in my tier pick. So if these two are facing each other, one of them is going to eliminate the one, other one anyway. So I'm going to go with BYU here. They have a lot of scoring options. And with the way that Illinois' defense has been, it's been tough. But I will say this team, you know, one of the other things that I think BYU does well is that they find ways to be very efficient from two when they're trying to get their way in there. And it's been a problem. Illinois has allowed teams to get to the rim, to rim a little bit too easy. Uh, this team has so many things going on for it, but if it can't defend, it can't win. And that's just the, kind of the problem here. It's kind of like a Big 12 football team in the uh, college football playoff. You can't defend, you can't win. Uh, so it's going to be Illinois. You're, if you're an Illinois fan, you're hoping for a great defensive performance. and You're looking for guys like Coleman Hawkins to step up for Illinois in this one. All right, so we've got Drake facing Iowa State. Iowa matchup here is what we've got put together here. What are you guys thinking in this one for the Sweet 16, for who's going to the Sweet 16? As much as I like Drake in this one, Iowa State's too hot here. Give me Iowa State. Caleb, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'll follow that up. As much as I want the Cinderella story of Drake to continue on here, I think it ends here with Iowa State taking the win. I am I am with you guys. I do like Iowa State uh, quite a bit, but Drake's darn good. Um, I'm going to go Iowa State, and I'm going to go with the grain here on this one, though. I, I think this is an interesting matchup, and I think that defense from Iowa State is just a lot to deal with. That That is a tough, de- tough, tough defense. All right, so our Sweet 16 shapes out like this. We got UConn taking, out San, taking on San Diego State. Guys, this was the national championship game last year. What are you guys thinking uh, in this portion of the bracket? Who wins between UConn and San Diego State? Caleb, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, and this one, you know, I, I think San Diego State, like we say, comes in with a chip on the shoulder in this matchup. But once again, I think UConn is such a complete team that I think they're going to, you know, take them out once again and move on to the Elite Eight. Maddie, what are your thoughts? I think it's going to be a great, great game, but I'm I'm going with the Huskies as well here with Caleb. So here's my opinion on UConn. Um, they're dang hard to beat, and this offense is fantastic. The offense is where this team excels. It shoots under, uh, just under 50% of the season. It's top 10 in the country, top five in adjusted offense. Uh, they move the ball well. This is one of the most complicated offenses you're going to see in the tournament. Uh, UConn uses everything from scissors, fake ball screens, pops, lifts, uh, d- you know, dribble handoffs, curls, rolls. I just It's going to look like they're improv things at times. And that's how crazy this offense and Dan Hurley could teach a master class to Nate Oates on how to run an offense. He really could. Uh, and those are two great offensive coaches, but Dan Hurley's insane. Uh, he, he, the way his offense is ran. Uh, they run extremely fast in transition. They run up tempo. Uh, they run up tempo in their half court stakes. What's taking so long for their possessions when you look at the time differences between them and an offense like Alabama is that how complex their half court sets are. Um, and that's what takes so long, but it's really hard to defend. You're going to see double stagger screens and everything on this team. You got guys like Cam Spencer, Tristan Newton, Alex Caravan, Donovan Klingon, and uh, Stefan Castle, who are all averaging over 10 points per game. Yeah, give me UConn, man. Like, give me the Huskies. There's a lot to like about this team, and they're they're legit. So I'm moving UConn into my Elite Eight. All right. What do you guys like between Iowa State and BYU? This is crazy, right? This this is an interesting one. And BYU has beaten Iowa State already once this season. And I do believe, let me check back here on my facts here, but didn't BYU beat Iowa State at Iowa State? I'm not 100% sure on that, but I know that BYU's got a win over them once already. What are you guys thinking? I'm going to go with Iowa State here. Um, I don't. It, it's honestly, it's just a gut feeling. I, I don't even know why, but... BYU is a good team. You need more than shooting, though, if you're going to make it far in March. Caleb, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'm going to keep rolling with BYU. I think their shooting is going to be great. You know, Iowa State comes in with a tough defense, but I think it's going to be a great matchup. But I'm going to, like you mentioned, they have beat them once this season, and I think they find that same, you know, game plan and, you will get the win here to upset number two Iowa State. BYU is interesting, and I'm waiting for another gunslinger to play with them. That's what that's what I'm waiting for. Like I think BYU can go as far as they want as long as they don't run into another gunslinging team like say someone like Alabama or in UConn in the Elite Eight. So I'm with you. Give me BYU. This team's deficient assisted team may sit outside the top forty um, for a likely Final Four contender, but this offense is elite. 
it, it's truly elite and has a lot of qualities that national champions have. I, I'm going BYU. They're a complex team to deal with, and you're guarding all five guys um, when you're dealing with this team. So I like their ability to run and transition and everything else. So I, I, give me the Cougars in this one. Well, I mean, that will set us up with an Elite Eight matchup between BYU and UConn. Does a six seed make the final four here? Guys, what are you thinking? Give me the Huskies. Yeah, David, like you just said, I think it's one of those things where BYU runs into a team that just plays as well and shoots as well as they do. And unfortunately, their their run in March comes to an unfortunate end against the Huskies here. Yeah, I, I think that offense is pretty hard to deal with um, for BYU, and that's going to be a lot. And then also, you know, UConn plays decent enough defense. Uh, this is not a bad defensive team, sub-100 rate. Uh, defensive rating and top 20 in adjusted defense. Uh, the, this is this is a good team. Uh, my only concern against UConn is overall their schedule is a little bit softer than maybe people realize it is, and they haven't been completely battle-tested as much as their peers, um, but UConn looks pretty darn good. So give me UConn to advance to the Final Four uh, in this one. So, so far, our Final Four, that's our first one seed that we've advanced to the Final Four. So we got UConn, we've got Tennessee, and we have Arizona in the Final Four. Let's jump over to the South. We've got Houston taking on Longwood here. I don't think anybody's taking on uh, Houston. We did talk about the fact that uh, Longwood's coach does have some U, uh, UMBC ties here, but uh, are we all going with Houston in this one? Yeah, it's only yeah. happened twice, and I don't this long. I think this Longwood team is going to make Houston sweat a little bit more than they maybe like. But this defense is overwhelming, and I, I like Houston's defense a lot. Let's jump to Nebraska and Texas A and M. This is an interesting matchup. Uh, Texas A and M uh, came off really hot. In the SEC tournament, they had to put a lot on the line and just ran out of gas against Florida. Playing Nebraska. Oh, oh, I love the story about Nebraska this season. I mean, who doesn't? This is a lot of fun to talk about Nebraska getting back in to the NCAA tournament. And they love to shoot the basketball there for the Cornhuskers. This is a fun, fun team to take a look at. Guys, who do you like between the Cornhuskers and the Aggies in this one? Give me Wade Taylor for the win. Um, you know, they've had to kind of dig themselves out of a slump to even make it into the tournament. And a lot of people are saying they don't deserve the nine seed that they were given. So I'm hoping they prove everybody wrong and take out Nebraska in the first round. I'm going to be one of those people who say they don't deserve a nine seed. They deserve an 11. Um, but Caleb, who do you got in this? Yeah, give me Nebraska here in this one. Um, I can't count on a buzz team right now. Just the way they ended last year. You know, the previous year, barely missing out on the tournament. I, I just – they've had a great season. You know, Wade Taylor is a great player, but I really see Nebraska coming out with a win in this one. Uh, Tomonaga is an excellent shooter. He averages 14.8 14, 14. points per game. Uh, and then you got uh, Mass, who does a really good job on their rebounding. And Nebraska is actually winning the glass uh, on a consistent basis in a league that's not easy to win the glass in. Uh, and they do a pretty good job of putting up points and holding teams to under 70 points a game. 69.2 is their average. They don't foul a lot either, and they hit 10, th almost 10 three-pointers a game. Give me the Cornhuskers to advance to the round of 32 to face Houston. I think that's going to be a lot of fun, but I, I think that's a coin flip game. I can't believe how many eights I've picked. Uh, that's totally against trend here, but not going to dismiss Texas A&M. Uh, Wade Taylor's a player who can drag you to some Ws, and he's certainly a more than capable player. Let's jump to Wisconsin and James Madison here. Another 12-5 matchup that's extremely entertaining. Um, good grief. I mean, this has been a wild year. We didn't have a single five upset this year, but I, almost all the 12s can be to five this season. James Madison won 30 games of the season. They were the conference champion in the Sun Belt. They're taking on a Wisconsin team that before the conference tournament was looking like they were lost, didn't know what they were doing, and people were even going to question if they were going to make the NCAA tournament. They were never really in doubt, but people who may have not known bracketology that well were like, is Wisconsin going to make it? Well, they made it, and they finished runner-up in the Big Ten tournament. Um, guys, who do you like between this matchup between Wisconsin and James Madison? I really like this James Madison team. I picked them to win their conference championship, but I think Wisconsin's going to outclass them just a little bit, um, with the talent level. So give me Wisconsin in this one. Caleb, what are you thinking? Give me the Dukes of James oh, Madison. In this one. You know, it's like you said, Nebraska or Wisconsin has, seemed lost towards the end of the season and James Madison is coming off of a 31 and three season into the tournament. And you, you got to look at Edwards jr. For them shooting 17.4 averaging 17.4 points per game, 82% from the line. 
Give me James Madison and get the upset in this one over Wisconsin. This is insane because last year, no 12s beat a five. And here we are. We got we like a lot of these 12s this year. James Madison's darn good. I mean, they're they're a darn good team. Um, but for the Badgers, you know, this team, you know, they have some of the worst luck on Kim Palm. Um, the worst Kim Palm rating and luck that there is. The Badgers play at a slower pace. This is the second slowest team in the Big Ten. Uh, and James Madison's proven that they can totally beat Big Ten competition when they beat Michigan State earlier this season. Uh, yeah, um, the rebounding is anything but elite on Wisconsin as well. Um, I do like guys like Chucky Hepburn. And I do like AJ Store uh, for Wisconsin, but I'm going to go with Caleb here, and I can't believe how many 12s we're picking right now. I'm going James Madison, man. This is This is not a bad James Madison team, and I think it's scary enough. Uh, to cause some issues and they've beaten some quality teams in the Sun Belt. So uh, give me give me James Madison in this. All right, let's turn to the next one. That'll advance James Madison to the round of 32. We got Duke versus Vermont. You know, Vermont's one of those teams we see year after year. They're a popular one to pick um, because of the NCAA tournament experience and the way that they shoot. But they're picking on Duke, who's a quality team who may have lost that first round of the ACC tournament. There's actually a lot of sneaky under the radar stuff things to like about Duke. And of course, if you are a Christian Leitner hater, hater, um, Kyle Filipkowski exists on this team uh, for you to hate on on this Duke team as well. So it, it's always there. All right. So what do you guys like, Duke or Vermont? Give me Duke for this one. Um, as much as I like Vermont, you know, they had some questions about them going into their their tournament finals. Um, had, a, had a rough draw there. So I, I'm going to go with Duke. All right, Caleb, who do you like? Yeah, as much as I'd love to see the Catamounts advance on, this Duke team I think is just going to be too much led by Filipowski. It's just one of those things where this is just a pure bad luck of the draw for Vermont as they go up against one of the Blue Bloods in college basketball and the Duke Blue Devils. Yeah, it this is this is a good Duke team. It's balanced. It's got a top tier offense. It finished second in the ACC. I don't really hold as much weight in conference tournaments as people normally talk about here uh philip kowski is one of the probably the best one of the best draft picks uh, college players coming into this year's draft this team is top 50 in assists in the country tyrese proctor has a lot of things that he can contribute from passing the basketball um the offense though i do feel can be dismantled with the dominant big being used to take away the paint from this team um but it's going to take an athletic defender too at this point and that's kind of how arizona beat duke earlier this year in cameron uh so but i'm gonna take duke here i, I like duke uh to get this job done this team's got a sweet 16 elite eight feeling to this duke team so I, i'm gonna go ahead and i'm gonna advance the blue devils for us into the next round texas tech versus north carolina state north carolina state would not have been in the tournament if it had not been for the fact they beat north carolina last night uh in the acc championship Guys, who do you like? Do you like the Red Raiders or do you like North Carolina State to continue this hot streak because they won five games in five days? Give me North Carolina State. I like this upset here. DJ Burns! <laughs> yeah, I, I'll follow Maddie there. Give me NC State and DJ Horn and DJ Burns, the big man down low. Working the paint against North Carolina. You got to love it. And then you also have... DJ Horn that's playing 32 minutes a game and averaging nearly 17 points per game. There's a lot to like there, man. Like that's, that's a quality quality team uh, for North Carolina state. There's a couple of players on this Texas tech team that I think, you know, everybody needs to get a little bit nervous about uh, in this matchup. Red Raiders are good. They're not great, but they're, they're good. Uh, they're a more than quality team. Um, but yeah, I think when you look at pops, Isaac and um, you know, Warren Washington, I don't know. Um, but one game for North Carolina state would be wild, but I, I'm, I'm going to personally go with Texas tech here. I'm going to go Texas tech. Uh, that just seems to me like the better pick, but we will advance North Carolina state. You two, uh, and, uh, we'll go ahead and take the 11 seed over the six here, Kentucky versus Oakland. I I'm pretty confident in Kentucky here. This does not seem like an Oakland team that takes things down, but maybe you guys see something I don't. Um, out of the horizon league champion, but what, who are you going with here? I know this is the worst. I am going to, be blunt here because Kentucky fans already hate me. Um, the Kentucky fans may believe, have dreams about this being a national championship team, but I want people to understand this is the worst defense Cal has ever had in the Kim Palm era since he returned to college coaching. That includes teams at Memphis, and that includes the national championship team that was built like this. And then once we talked about, there's less and less McDonald's All-Americans in the national championship every year. Guys, what are you thinking here between Kentucky and Oakland? As much as I like Oakland stats, 
uh, going into this. You know, like you said, Horizon League champions. I think this Kentucky team um, has got too much offensively for them. Caleb, what do you think? Yeah, kind of similar to what Maddie said. I think Kentucky's going to get this one. You know, you got their stud freshman, one of their stud freshmen, Reed Shepard, that just can shoot the lights out of the gym. And I think he's going to be a big part of this team along with Antonio Reeves. So I think they take care of business here against Oakland. Yeah, I'm going to go Kentucky too. That's going to be unanimous on us uh, for that one. Let's go to Florida, who is going to be taking in one of the first four champions here between either Boise State or Colorado. Guys, who do you like in this uh, setup here? Do you like the Gators? And they did just lose Micah Hanlog and down low for a gruesome injury in the SEC tournament championship. Uh, prayers for Micah. Um, but just looking at this matchup, do you like the Gators or do you like Colorado or Boise State in this matchup? You know, for Florida, um, if that unfortunate injury hadn't happened, I would have expected them to go farther in March than I think most people would. Um, but with that injury, I think they're going to make it through the first round, but the second is going to be questionable for me. But I'm, I'm going to have them win in over either Boise State or Colorado. Caleb, what are your thoughts here on the Gators? Yeah, I'm going to follow the same sentiment. Yeah, that's tough losing you know, a player like that and in some depth. But I think they have enough to get by this first round. But when you start looking through future matchups, I think that's where they're going to struggle some. And But for this and the purposes, I think they move on to the second round. I think if you got Boise State, that would certainly be the tougher matchup uh, for uh, for Florida out of the two. But I, I'm certainly I, I like the Gators here. They got a wide range of scoring options from Walter Clayton, Zion Pullen, uh, Tyree Samuel, and Will Richard. They're all averaging above double figures for this team. They just came off a bad shooting day uh, against Auburn. Uh, I don't think that's going to continue. Uh, Samuel, of course, Seton Hall transfer is the leader in the front court. He often plays at the four, but you can put him anywhere and he can put up points in a hurry and he plays solid defense. Uh, to me, give me the Gators in this one. Uh, to me, there's a reason I call him Alabama Junior. This is an analytically driven team um, that's just one step right now behind what Alabama does. This is Alabama with the front court, though. And that's what makes the Florida just a better team right now to pick in March. And certainly the reason why they've beaten Alabama twice is that they they can do much better things in the front court. So give me the Gators here to advance to round of 32. Marquette versus Western Kentucky. What are you guys thinking here? Anything you like? I know Isaac talked that Western Kentucky was probably a little bit underseeded. Do you guys, is this the two versus 15 game? I don't know if this is quite the two versus 15 game. I like Marquette, even though, you know, um, I feel like they aren't as good as some people have expected them to be. I think they're going to get the job done and move on to the second round. Caleb, what are your thoughts on this matchup? Yeah, I, I got kind of got to follow that sim similar sentiment there. You know, as much as I would like to see that Western Kentucky team that has been said to be underseeded make a run there, I think. Marquette gets the job done here in the, the first round and makes it to the round of 32. We're your flirt with disaster. We've not picked a two. Oh, we're not picked a 15 teed yet. And what's been a trend for the last three years, but like so many people have pointed out because of the chaos that happened, in a lot of these conference tournaments, some of these 15 and 16s are not as strong as they have been in years past. Uh, so I think Western Kentucky is really darn good. I think it, this might be another good opportunity for this to occur, but uh, give me Marquette in this one. Uh, Tyler Kolek also is going to be a big player. I believe he's coming back for this game for Marquette. So, yeah, go ahead and give me Shaka Smart and the Marquette Golden Eagles. Let's go back to the top here where we've got Houston taking on Nebraska. The, or did we pick Nebraska or Texas A&M? I'm sorry. Nebraska. Nebraska. Okay. So we got Houston taking on Nebraska in this one. Guys, what are your thoughts? Like, this is, this is going to be a weird one. Got a lot of defense playing, a lot of offense. This is a really weird one. Um, you know, Houston made me nervous um, in their conference tournament, their last game of that. But I think they might edge out Nebraska. It really is another coin flip game for me. It depends on what Houston team we see. Um, but if we see the consistent Houston team that we saw pretty much throughout the season, I think we see Houston get the win here. Caleb, who are you going with? Yeah, I think a Houston team with Kelvin Sampson, they made that run last year. I think they retooled, come back, played very consistent this year, and like we said, have, have have the ability to score. So I think the Houston moves on to the Sweet 16. 
Yeah, to me, even in that Iowa State loss, the Houston defense didn't go anywhere. It was still there. Uh, it was just their offense just could not live up to it. And this is a, fanta- a fascinating defense to analyze. Drop coverage for most teams is the answer for dealing with ball screens because the roller is typically the most effective shooter per shot. Um, that's not what Houston does. Uh, they hedge screens as much. They don't really hedge screens as much as attack the line of scrimmage that's created on the ball handler. And it's really more of a blitz. And you're going to hear commentators call it a trap. Uh, and I don't know if Nebraska is talented enough to deal with just how aggressive this Houston defense is. This is not an analytically driven defense, but it's effective uh, and it really works. Um, you know, to me, offenses can play against them. They're going to need a solid passing attack. And I, I just don't know if Nebraska is talented enough for this Houston team. So give me Houston to advance uh, in this one to the Sweet 16. Let's jump down the line here where we got James Madison taking on Duke. Is this the end of the run for the Dukes against Duke? I'm going to go with the Blue Devils in this one. Um, like you guys said in the last round, James Madison, a great team, only with three losses on their resume, but the Duke Blue Devils, pretty balanced team. I think they're going to be able to overcome it. I would agree with that sentiment. I'm going to go ahead and say Duke. Caleb, are you with that? Yeah. Yeah, I, Duke. I think Duke's in a different class. Um, but, like, yeah, James Madison get the upset over Wisconsin, yeah, and then I got Duke advancing to the Sweet 16. Let's go to Pittsburgh uh, for that round of 32. Who's going to go in the Sweet 16 between North Carolina State and Kentucky? This is more intriguing than we originally talked about it because I'm thinking about something right now. But what? how do you guys see this matchup? It's a tough one. Really? I mean, we've, got, we've, we've got two teams um, that are really hot uh, when it comes to their offense right now. Um, that front court matchup is going to be tough. Um, but give me Cal and give me Kentucky. Yeah, okay. I, I can understand. I can respect that. That's certainly the more talented team uh, with the more experienced coach in March. But, Caleb, how do you see this one? Yeah, you know, you got to love what you're seeing from both sides of this. You know, really good Kentucky team that can shoot the ball really well. But like you said, David, their defense has been their Achilles heel of the season. And going off that, give me NC State to upset Kentucky and move on here. I really think that Kentucky's offense can be disrupted by putting a five man in the paint and being willing to switch on your guarding defenders. Uh, Kansas did that against them in the champions classic and they played drop coverage on Fierro in the second half. Kentucky has an answer for switches though. And they utilize what's called a boomerang pass uh, on their guards off bat and to get guards off balance. Uh, they're one of the, this is the fastest wild King cat wildcat team we've seen in years. Uh, and they get defenders off balance really fast, and they set up Reed Shepard in the triple threat form for his shooting options. So it's going to be difficult to deal with. Um, but to me, it's fascinating with DJ Burns in this situation being that five man because he can really exploit that front court that Kentucky has, which has been one of their Achilles heels this season, especially on defense. And then if you put him in that five position in paint, it can be really disruptive. So I'm going to go North Carolina State. I don't like it but I'm going to go North Carolina state in this one, just because I think they have the right pieces to do this. Kentucky's definitely the more talented team and the team that should win it. Um, But I'm going to go for chaos here and I'm going to pick North Carolina state. Like this is, this is nuts. I I did not think about this until you guys advance North Carolina state. If it goes Texas tech, I'm going Kentucky, but if it's North Carolina state, I don't like that matchup. And that's a, that's a bad, bad matchup. All right, let's go to Florida versus Marquette in this one, guys, what are you thinking? I mean, if we had a fully healthy Florida team, I would say that they had an edge over Marquette. Um, but with hand logged and out, um, probably a gas Florida team at this point. I'm going to go with Marquette moving on. Caleb, what are your thoughts on this Florida versus Marquette matchup we've put together? Yeah, I kind of got to follow suit there. With, you know, you got to look at Florida. They were able to bounce back in that game today and play a little, little bit better and get it closer. Auburn still ultimately got the win, but. They were still able to get it back into contention. But like Maddie said, I think with a loss and they're going to have some depth issues and they're going to get gassed here. So I see Marquette getting the win here. So, okay, so that will advance Marquette for our bracket. But uh, I'm just going to point this out is that Florida does have some backups in that front court with Condon and a few other guys. Marquette's not the greatest rebounding team of all time. And Florida's won the glass by almost eight boards a game. Uh, personally, I'd take the Gators in this one, and I think they're more than capable of doing it. Um, they would have to defend without fouling, though, and that's going to be the tree key, especially the pace that Marquette plays at. So that one, to me, is more of a coin toss, but I definitely understand the Marquette advancement here in this situation. So that leaves us back at the top of the bracket, Houston versus Duke. Who do you guys like in this one to make the Elite Eight? 
I'm going to go with Houston in this one. You know, they, they've had that consistency all year. I think that's where Duke has really struggled. They've been up and down the season where they've had times that they look really good. They've had times where they've struggled. And I think if you look at these two teams comparatively, I'm going to move, move Houston on to the Elite Eight. Maddie, who are you going with, Duke or Houston? Oh, yeah. I, this one's a hard one. This one's a hard one. Um, I'm going to go with Caleb, though. I'm going to go Houston. Kelvin Sampson, I feel like, is the better coach when we have the matchup there. I'm going to go Duke. And this is where I cut Houston off. I think they made the Sweet 16. But, like, to me, this is a very balanced Duke team that plays good enough defense and wins the glass. So, uh, they do a pretty effective job winning the glass, and uh, I don't think they want to play. You know, they'll play a little bit, a little bit faster than Houston. I like Duke, um, but uh, you guys have Houston advancing to the lead eight, so that's your pick. But I, I like Duke personally in this one. Uh, all right, so let's go on to our other Sweet Sixteen matchup, and that is Marquette versus North Carolina State. Who do we have advancing? I can't believe we got another one and two situation here. Who do we have advancing, Marquette or Hughes, or Marquette or North Carolina State? Let's start by Hail Mary. Let me let me take North Carolina State. <laughs> All right, it's not bad. Um, it's a Hail Mary pick for sure. Um, Caleb is is the magic run over for North Carolina State in the Sweet Sixteen. You know, there's a lot to look at with these two teams, but I think Marquette's going to feel the burn and NC State is going to move forward. <laughs> oh, you guys are ridiculous. All right, I I'm, I'm going to I'm just going to not allow this to go on and I'm going to say Jose Godaro is a good enough big man to take care of business and make sure that uh, DJ Burns uh doesn't doesn't take over the game. Uh yeah, I'm going to be Godaro in this one and Mark Hepp of oh, we'll advance North Carolina State guys, uh you know, to the Elite 8. They have now won what would that be? In North Carolina 1 2 3 they they would want that would be an eight game winning streak uh for North Carolina State. They're going hot. Um they they're feeling the burn there in Raleigh. All right, so that makes our Elite Eight matchup, Houston and North Carolina State. What do you want? What who do you like? Who, who do you like here? Because like th this is crazy. Who do you got? Give me Houston here. Um <laughs> All ridiculous out, ridiculousness out of the way, whether it's Marquette or whether it's NC State. I'm going to go with Houston getting at least to uh, the final four in this one. Caleb, are, you, are we still feeling the burn here against Houston? Unfortunately not. I think Houston's going to take care of that and move forward. Okay, so if that is the matchup, I would go Houston, but I, I've already eliminated Houston uh, with Duke. So... All right, so that's that's what we got there. Good grief. Um, yeah, I, I think Houston's defense is way overwhelming for just DJ Horn to come over that overcome it. And then uh, DJ Burns is not enough for two guys, not enough for two guys. Houston forces you to make a lot of tough passes. And I think that's a difficult situation for North Carolina State if that's the game. All right, this is our final four. We've got UConn taking on Arizona. And then we've got on the other side of the bracket, Houston taking on Tennessee in the final four. Okay, guys, who wins? Let's start with UConn and let's start with UConn and let's start with uh, UConn and um, good grief, Arizona. Who do you guys like in that one? I feel like this may be the closest game that we see throughout the bracket. Um, if this is the matchup and I'm actually going to go with Arizona. Okay. That's an interesting one. Uh, I I don't disagree. They they play really fast. Um, I, I I don't I don't agree, but um, yeah, they, it's it's a really good Arizona team, and Kara's, Caleb Love is certainly capable of it. My biggest concern with Arizona, though, is while this team is all right at shooting free throws, Ballo is not good, and we saw Nate Oates even try to take advantage of just how bad he is. A hack a shack situation waiting to happen, and sometimes all it can take in March Madness is one missed free throw, a defensive rebound. And a three point shot to send you uh, send you on to uh, the national championship or the next round. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pick UConn on this. They're a team that I think can face up pretty well to Arizona, even as fast as they play. UConn wants to play fast, too. They just run slower half court sets. So I'm going to go UConn and advance to my national championship. Caleb, who do you got, Arizona or UConn? Give me the Huskies. I like their odds to repeat. 
you know, they're like I've said, they're a complete team. I love how they match up and the way Dan Hurley runs his offense with all the different varieties that you're going to see. I think UConn advances here. Okay, so that sets us up for the other side where we have Houston taking on Tennessee. Guys, a national champion has never lost the first round of their conference tournament. I will just throw that out there now. But who do you got between Houston and Tennessee, and what do you like? Give me the vaults. Okay. I think Zakai Ziegler um, is a solid matchup for um, the Houston guard set, and Dalton Connect. You can't count the man out. I don't disagree there, Caleb. What are you thinking? Let's go with the balls in this one. Dalton Connect. I think they go on a tear. Him and Zakai Ziegler and hey, dude, they go on a tear in the tournament. And, you know, Rick Barnes finally gets that monkey off his back and gets to the finals. All right. So that would put Tennessee in the national championship with UConn. Um, but my pick is also Tennessee in this one. And the reason is, is to me, the offense is good enough to do the job. And you got options here. To me, like the X factor is guys like Emmanuel Sharp. LJ Cryer has to play a really good game against Tennessee. But these are two great defenses just banging it out. Uh, they, you know, that's going to be a big part of it. But to me, Tennessee's got the better offense. Uh, they want to play up tempo. They want to move the ball. They want to pass. They got an experienced backcourt to do that thing. When even when Houston's forcing tough passes and Jonas Adu, when he's on, Tennessee's hard to beat. When he's playing at their best, that's not Dalton Connect that's going to have to carry Tennessee. It's Jonas Adu in those moments when they can't score. And to me, if they're going to leave Jonas Adu open in that back five safety set that Houston likes to do. I like Tennessee against Houston in that matchup. So, yeah, I'm with y'all. Like, move Tennessee into the national championship for me. Uh, I know that's crazy. I know it's Rick Barnes in March. But from a matchup standpoint, I like Tennessee here uh, to get to the national championship as far as that draw goes. So our national championship game is UConn versus Tennessee. Does UConn repeat or do we have a national champion out of the volunteers? Give me the balls. I think if they can make it that far, they can win, win it all. Okay, Maddie's sticking with her Vegas bet. Caleb, what are you thinking? Give me UConn with a repeat championship this season. I think I've explained as much. Yeah, I I think I've explained as much as I can at this point Mm -hmm. on UConn. They have the pieces. They look great. They have a lot of the criteria that you're looking for in national champions. Um, This offense is going to be a lot, even with a really good defense for Tennessee to deal with. Um, You'll see, like I said, chin screens to the flex and everything else. Um, yeah, and I think UConn can defend pretty well too. Give me the UConn Huskies as the national champions. Uh, it's a tough pick there. It's a tough pick. It's back to back years now. I've picked back to back champions, so we'll see what happens. Um, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go UConn, and I think they do it. And that would be the first time we have a national champion, um, repeat since 2007, since the Florida Gators did it. And UConn seems like a pretty darn good candidate. Caleb, you've been hanging out the entire time on this show today. Um, so I'm going to let you start out first. Who are three teams that you are cheering for outside of the SEC in this tournament? Give me the Grand Canyon Lopes. Okay. Let's go the Drake Bulldogs. Then I've got to do it as much as I know we just put them in this championship game. But give me the Peacocks of St. Peter's. <laughs> yep, I, I I don't blame you. They've they've created a lot of fandom and love out there. But that is that is a March team right there, one that's born known in March. But I, I like that pick. That's fun. Um, do you have one more that you want to throw out there? I, I said I said three, but I picked four earlier. I guess so. Who's who's your other one? Maybe North Carolina State. You seem pretty big on the Burns. <laughs> Yeah, let's go North Carolina State. I like I like the the big man, and we'll see what they can do in this tournament after you know getting that big win in the ACC tournament. All right, Maddie, who are your non SEC teams you're cheering for? Oh, okay, give me Houston. I go with the Cougars. Okay, I don't know. I wasn't prepared for this. Um, I mean, I I like the Lopes too. I I put them pretty far in our bracket as well. Um, I don't think UAB is going to win, but I'm definitely going to watch their game and cheer for them. Um, 
at least be excited that they made it to the tournament. <laughs> and outside of that, uh, me the McNeese State Cowboys. As much like I said, I don't want to cheer for Will Wade, but this is a hard team to cheer against. I understand. All right, my four. I'm going BYU. Uh, give me Jackson Robinson and this exciting, fun offense to watch and a great, great fan base. Uh, and then give me Washington State. Um, they just seem like it, it, it's so weird. Like I said, we talked about earlier this season, you know, teams that with the Pac-12 in the offseason, you know, how bad the situation is out there. And Washington State was one of those teams kind of shunned, uh, you know, out of the Big Ten movement and everything else. And then they got a great story going on in a team that was picked to the bottom of the conference and they're doing so well. Give me Washington State. Uh, I'm also big on the Drake Bulldogs. I'll be cheering for them as well. I, I like Drake Bulldogs. And then give me South Dakota State. Uh, give me the Jacks. Uh, you know, this is a team that deserves a win. Um, they've put together some great talents over the years, like Mayo. And they've also put together great guys like, uh, you know, Baylor Shireman, who's Creighton's enjoying now. They've just never been able to put it all together and make that incredible run uh, for a team. So I'm going to get, give me, give me South Dakota state or a team I'm cheering for. Uh, so I, I like them a lot as well. Unfortunately, I feel like all those teams ended up in the same bracket of, you know, I, I'd have to look at it again, but I feel like all the teams I liked ended up in the same bracket uh, for the teams I'll be cheering for outside this conference. Caleb, why don't you tell everybody where they can find your incredible podcast and all the drama that's going on around Arkansas. Yeah, you can find us on Big weekly. We have our YouTube channel, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Go check us out. We're covering everything. It is finally baseball season for those in Arkansas. You know what relief that is. And, yeah, go check us out. Definitely go check out Woopig Weekly. It's a great podcast. They got some great interviews on there as well, including Coach Houston Nutt came by at one point. Uh, They've had some baseball players like Peyton Stovall to come by and uh, and record with them as well. Uh, Great channel. Definitely go check out Woopig Weekly. Uh, if you have not liked and subscribed to the Hoop Southbound show, we would greatly appreciate it if you did. Um, we'd love it. And um, yeah, we're trying to let this grow. We will be back um, with this after Friday night on Friday night with our round of 32 coverage at that point. We'll see how this bracket shapes out after that. Best two days in college basketball coming up on this weekend for Thursday and Friday. We'll be covering all that. Me and Maddie will be talking about it. We are in full March Madness mode. And of course, our priority would be first to talk about the SEC teams uh, when that all shakes out. But this is our bracket show. Please like and subscribe. Follow us anywhere you get on podcasts. And guys, thank you so much. Let's enjoy the madness because it's that time of year, baby. It's absolutely great. Catch you guys on Friday night. Thanks guys. Have a great week.